Good morning. Welcome to OTB AM. I'm not Jerry Gilroy. You're not on Sheehan. What the <laughs> hell is going on? Thank God for that. <laughs> Bloody hell. I wouldn't want to look in the mirror at seven You're in the morning. You're just missing the hair. <laughs> it's a little bit easier for you when you get out of bed in the morning, isn't it? But he's going with the old trim bit these days. Yeah, on a, it's very hipster, isn't it? I haven't it? seen it up close. I've just seen it on, uh, just seen it on the telly. Camera. Yeah, what, what, where's the move you, there? What, what's he thinking? I think he's trying to uh, give himself a more mature complexion. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. He's, making he's the worried he's that, making you know, the his, his initial youthful enthusiasm that he yeah. brought to the role, everyone appreciated. Yeah, but yeah. now he's delving into deeper stuff, more hardcore yeah. topics. He's looking for a bit of respect that maybe the beard gives him some... He's not, he's not happy missing added out. Added gravitas. Yeah, he's not happy missing out on that top table of those uh, radio awards every year, is he? You know, year in, year out. At home in the armchair. Is this what with he's a bowl, done, yeah. With a bowl of Rice Krispies watching you, uh, Jer and, uh, you know, Joe uh, sweep the board consistently. Well, I think he's only, making his play. If only, if only he turns up those nights. Uh, if only he was at home. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Life would be uh, a lot oh, easier. He, for he him. tags along. He's had, he he's had a along. few difficult Saturday mornings, is all I'll do you say. You send him to the bar to get the drinks to the table. Absolutely. That, those type People of do mistake him for a waiter from time <laughs> to time. How are you? Yeah, all good. All good. Are we allowed to talk about Game of Thrones? Uh, oh, that's you watch Game of Thrones? No, I haven't. Ah, Kenny. I'll tell you when I stopped watching it. I stopped watching a couple of years ago. Spoiler alert. And I switched on the uh, an episode and Ed Sheeran was sat around the campfire. It's fact. <laughs> I, happened? I thought to myself, no, I'm not. This is... So wait, you'd gone through about four series and no, then Ed Sheeran no, pops up and I'd gone said, through the not having that, pal. No, I'd gone through the first couple of series, gone away from it, came back. Now, I'll give it a go. I did quite enjoy it, but came back to it, but... That for me, that's inexcusable. It's similar to kind of um, what's like the Guy Ritchie film? Uh, ex- no, not Excalibur. Uh, what's the remake Guy, Guy Ritchie did? The uh, you've lost me. This the the our famous English the sword the sword and the stone. Excal not Excalibur. Ah, yeah. oh, David Beckham. I'm talking about. Guy King Ritchie Arthur. made a, King Arthur, exactly. David Beckham was in King Arthur. Yeah, made a little what? cameo role for da- uh, David Beckham ah, in King Arthur. So for me, that's that. when the whole thing uh, kind of falls apart. And so what you're telling me is, you were grand with dragons, you were grand with Jon Snow being brought back to life. Oh, yeah. You were grand with the White Walkers. All of that, believable. Ed Sheeran. No, nah, nah. Ed Sheeran was a step too far, and uh, uh, similar to David Beckham, Coy Richie went way down on me. I think you lose a little bit of integrity there, the whole series. That, sh- really, Ed Sheeran? He does look... People accept that? Does he not look yeah, like but he it's Ed could Sheeran. belong in that yeah, but it's imaginary Ed, era? Yeah, but it's Ed, she- it's Ed Sheeran. You expect him to whip a you know, guitar out from underneath his tunic and get the sing song going around the campfire, aren't you? Do we have David Beckham and King Arthur? <laughs> he's got the look, doesn't he? Yeah, but even worse, he gave him a talking part. He let him talk for about <laughs> 10 seconds. That was even worse. Have you never forgiven Beckham since he floated that ball over your head from the halfway line? That's hard. You can't be blaming me, Nathan, for that now when I was 40 <laughs> yards away from me when you had the shot. Why didn't you close him down? Yeah, yeah. Get your defence in order. Get the midfield <laughs> tracking back. No, not personally against Beckham, but uh, no. No, I wasn't there. That's a step too far for me. You, you gotta, you gotta get back into Game of Thrones. It's I the might watch series. the last. Yeah, I might when I get you back. You can't just jump back in, surely. I think I'm fairly sure Ed Sheeran only appears in that one episode, so you're ah, fine. It's enough. It's one an Ed Sheeran safe zone. <laughs> so I'll just move I, on. Yeah, Skip I think I will. I'll get on the last well. one. No, I think I could, Yeah, I'm gonna get on the last one definitely. We're not allowed to talk about it though. I guess that's the problem because even though I watched it yesterday, a lot of people might watch it for another few days, so you can't have a conversation about it. Because then you get, oh, I haven't seen it yet, job. Oh, people get a little bit vexed, do they? A little bit angry. Yeah, a bit serious, yeah, yeah. It's done well, though, isn't it? So what have you been up to? You were in with us on Saturday? Nice weekend? Yeah, yeah, I've had a decent hour weekend. Yeah, family's been over with me, so we've been uh, out and about a little bit. Weather hasn't been great, so, yeah, it's kind of stilted us a little bit in terms of what we could do. Young Flo wasn't too happy with the Viking bus that came around Stevens Graham. Oh, really? You just go past the building? Did yeah, you want well, well, I built it up. I said, look, they got this Viking bow. You're going to love it. Rah, cry, rah, rah, rah. And he was, yeah, yeah. Then the, uh, the Viking bus came around the, the corner of Stevens Graham. And he was like, <laughs> I can see on his face. <laughs> I think he's expecting the big long boat. That kind of affected the oar sticking out of the side, a real kind of, yeah, Game of Thrones type thing. Same, but uh, he was very disappointed with the... Uh, and did you get thing. on it? No, he didn't get on it. What? No, there was no room. To be honest, there was no room for his bang. They can't get on that thing, can you? Boy, it's sold out. I've never yeah, been on it. They yeah, no. past our office here every day. And they're always roaring and shouting. Yeah, yeah. It looks say, like a bit of crap. Because, you know, you never go on it when you live in the city. 
he said, the fella said to me, to, he, had his, he, could, he, he may recognise, not be, I don't get recognised too much. So I went up, he said, oh yeah, yeah, okay, how's it going? He said, look, come over here, see what I can do, so, see what I can do for you. I went, grand, might get on there, the, the next one might make a bit of space. He said, look, tomorrow, quarter past five, I can get you, <laughs> I can what? get you a couple of Bloody hell, the boom is back, isn't it? <laughs> Tomorrow, quarter past five. I said, wow. look, I'll take a rain, literally, I'll take, take a rain check on that. I'll, I might drift in tomorrow for a round, but no, I didn't make it. What I am going to make, though, is Tato Park. I was mentioned it to, didn't I, today. Promised you will I take him out there, but it's just the weather conditions. You're not happy. You, you came oh. in this morning. You're looking for a definite I'm looking for a yeah, hour by hour of... weather forecast today, because what I don't want to be heading, it, the only reason we're going out there is to kill Cullen, obviously. He's mad on the, the roller coaster, so. Oh, yeah, will you go on? He'll go on now, he's made his money, he's going to go, go on. on. But I don't want to drag him out there and literally walk him up to the entrance to the Kukulun and find it's uh, closed due to uh, the weather conditions. And did the Kukulun not work in the rain? Well, the w- it was about 50 mile an hour winds yesterday. That's I know it's sto- it stoyed a little bit. So, I was yeah. out there last summer, but I had the kids with me and they're too young, so therefore I couldn't yeah. go out, which yeah. gave me a good excuse. It's pretty big. It is now. It's, you like a roller coaster? I'm not a big fan, but this uh, this one, I'll, I'll get, as long as it hasn't got a, an in, inver- any inversions, I'm, not, I'm pretty much all the right. The problem if it's raining is they also have that other roller coaster type thing that goes in, through the water. Yeah, yeah. And if it's cold, you're going to be bloody freezing. I'll be, when you get out. You're no, be, be saturated. Yeah. Well, this is, it's all about that. Bring a spare pair of pants. I travel light. You know, Ryanair, that luggage allowance, you've got, you got, <laughs> you got to make the extra. You've got to make some tough decisions before you uh, pack a suitcase. So is your, is your young lad then coming over here growing up on the outskirts of London just looking down and going, really? You expect me to be impressed by Tato Park? I can go to, I can go to Alton Towers every day of the week. I'll tell you what he is impressed by. Tato Crisps. <laughs> He's been all over them all weekend. Loves them, loves them. Plus you get to tour of the Tato factory out there, how do you actually oh, yeah, make yeah, the crisps. Yeah, yeah. And to top it all off, a free bag of Tao crisps, when you're including in your door. entrance. When you're walking out, when you're the walking door. out the door. Are you getting paid by? Little by does he Tato. know, I've actually paid for it. I've actually paid for that bag of crisps. Are you the getting paid by Tato? Well, you mightn't have to pay for it after this, is what I'm thinking. Have you bought your tickets in advance? Oh no, we're just rolling oh, up. You're going to get the warmest welcome of any man in Ireland rock, when you're going to rock up straight to the top morning. of the queue of Coo Cullen. I doubt it. We're thinking I, my dad's a superstar. I, I don't mind the queue within reason. Actually, I saw a. Hey, we must show it to you. I don't know if anyone sent it on. We got sent in a photograph of you at the uh, game on Friday night. Right. The, of uh, you were handing over your captain's armband to a child in the crowd. Ah, oh, no, that, that was my own flag, actually. That's that, what I was wondering, like, because he was yeah. in there. Like, was like, he was wearing a hat. So you yeah. pass off. Is this a symbolic passing <laughs> on of passing of the guard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, not really. Not really, to be honest with you. No, I just, I, I, nah, I, just, I just went over. I didn't want to take him on the pitch or anything like that. So um, I wasn't going to take my jersey off for obvious reasons. So I'll throw the old uh, armband. I was at Anfield on uh, Sunday with um, Kevin Kilban, who also played in the game. <sighs> Dear God. Wasn't moving well, was he? That man was walking like a 75-year-old. <laughs> I'd say it took us 25 minutes to walk from the car to Anfield, and it was no more than 200 metres. He had a funny old night. Hobbling along. In right. agony. Nathan, he wasn't a happy man. He wasn't a happy man. He came on 10 minutes before half time, couldn't get a kick at the ball, was going around screaming at everybody, giving him a kick. And then 10 minutes into the second half, uh, calf almost. He wasn't happy popped. with you. He wouldn't go off. He wasn't happy with you. I was trying to get him substituted. He said his calf popped right at the oh, start of the second yeah, half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, all he hears is you in the background telling the physio, get, get him, him off. off, get him off. He's like, Kenny, I'm only on the pitch two minutes. Don't look after him, Nathan. It's his long term health. It's his, lo- his long term <laughs> health. He's oh, absolutely about. destroyed. A fair play to him. He stuck it out. We get to the papers in a minute, but we have an amazing competition for you all this week on OTB AM with thanks to Turkish Airlines, proud sponsors of Cricket Ireland. Ireland is facing the busiest summer of cricket we've ever known, hosting some of the biggest teams in the world, such as England, West Indies and Bangladesh. Cricket Ireland are also hosting Zimbabwe and Afghanistan later in the summer. On May 5th, the Ireland's men's team will face England in Malahide with a tri-series against Bangladesh and West Indies to follow. So here at OTBM, we're giving you the chance to fly anywhere in the world with Turkish Airlines to enter. Just head to the link we've tweeted and posted in our live stream for OTBM and fill in the entry form. Simple as that. You a fan? Cricket? Uh, Does it do it for you? No. What? You want to get yourself out to Malahide? The sun is shining. Oh, I was yeah. out there today, Ireland played England, the first proper international, the one-day international about, what, six, seven years ago at this stage? Oh, glorious. Just get the dart out. 
nice relaxing afternoon. It's a great Chinese. It's a great Chinese out in Malahide. Oh, I can't remember Smashing. the name for it. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to name uh, one of the lads. We used to stay in the Palmeric Links Hotel. Yeah. It was known uh, for one of uh, my teammates to jump in his car, head down to the Chinese in Malahide, get a little takeaway in for the lads and bail back to the hotel, into, into his room, divvy up the Chinese. I think it might have closed. It's in the building. It's in one of the old... It is. Uh, the old petrol station. I know exactly uh, where it is. It's lovely. Pricey. Pricey, very pricey, but <sighs> look, worth it. Worth it. Anyways, here's what's coming up on OTBAM at some stage over the course of the morning. We look through the morning's papers in a moment at John Delaney, front and back page, after the news yesterday that he is stepping aside, albeit possibly temporarily, from his role as a executive vice president. We'll chat that after the papers as well. Uh, Kenny's going to talk us through Manchester United against Barcelona tonight, the possible tactics that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer can use as he invokes the spirit of 99 once again for the 28th consecutive game. Uh, we'll look at some of the big stories in football of the last few days as well. John Walters is going to be with us around about 8.40 to look ahead to the Champions League. Uh, we'll talk Israel Folau. We'll go across to Australia to chat with Jack Anderson about Israel Folau and his uh, suspension and sacking from Rugby Australia after his pretty horrific homophobic comments. Uh, John Duggan will be with us to talk about more golf because yesterday was obviously all Tiger talk. We didn't really have an opportunity to reflect on a disappointing week for Rory McIlroy as he continues his search for the career Grand Slam. And Arsenal got the job done last night. First clean sheet away from home all season against Watford but it was uh, Pretty fortuitous, I think we'll all agree. So Phil Egan will chat to us about that later in the afternoon. Busy, busy day. Did you enjoy Tiger? Didn't, did, I was ducking and diving all over the, the the city, so I didn't get a chance to sit down and actually watch it. Oh, I know. I could. I was hearing getting text through, and you could sense it. I was delighted. I mean, I can't believe I was. Nathan, I was in here about um, a year ago. It might have been an evening show with uh, Joe, and the target thing came up. He just had his back operate. Might have been a year, year and a half ago. And I was just making the point, I just said from a physical, forget about kind of like psychology, physically I said, I, I don't see where he can get himself back to a point where he can actually go and win a, a golf tournament, let alone one of the majors. Just physically, at the back operation, I think it was the second or... Fourth. The fourth, was it, at that point? So yeah. This, I just, was the, this was the fusion, which was the final one. Yeah, I just couldn't. I just said, I, I just can't under, uh, understand physically he's, he, he's going to be in a position to get himself back and compete at that level. And to be fair to Joe, Joe said this particular back surge, the fusion which he's mm. had, he said there's a good chance he can get himself back exactly where he wants to be and if that's the case he said there's no reason why he can't mentally he's strong enough but I doubted physically whether he could get himself back but yeah Davis Love had something similar and had this late career resurgence as well after he had the fusion Tigers always said that that final operation was for sort of day to day quality of life yeah. reasons I sort of wonder about that yeah I, I wonder if you're Tiger Woods yeah. like day to day quality of life being able to get out of bed What's the point of getting out of bed if you can't play competitive golf? Yeah, I think you're probably right. That was probably in the back of his head. I mean, he's so driven. We know that. He would probably, although he probably didn't admit to it, probably he was probably throwing those kind of comments out. But the back of the mind, he probably always thought, there's still a chance. There's still a chance for me to get myself back to where I need to be. And yeah, mate, it was great to see. I think it's great for everybody, golf. And even the players, when they're talking after the tournament, Nathan, they're saying, oh, it's great to see him come out. Sometimes you think, yeah, clenched teeth here. But you think genuinely the players are loving having him back, that kind of having Tiger at his peak to compete against and actually get the better of him over the next two, three, possibly even the five years, particularly younger players oh. who wouldn't have had the experience of walking on a golf course and playing against them. I was going to say it's a win-win for younger players, but obviously not quite because sometimes Tiger will be winning yeah. majors ahead of them. But in terms of growing the game, Tiger Woods is not just the talk of a sports radio programme yesterday. He's the talk of every yeah. single radio programme. Whereas if Brooks Kepka wins that, or Francesco Molinari, people move on pretty quickly. Yeah, you're right. But even from that, from Kep, say Kepka's point of view, he's been brilliant over the past mm. couple of years. At the end of his career, he looks back and it looks at one or two of those major championship wins. If he's won them with Tiger uh, Woods in the field and actually going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tiger on, the, on the, the final day, that's going to give you a huge amount of satisfaction rather than Tiger Woods not being involved whatsoever. Which he did. Which he yeah, did. Kept yeah. the USPGA last year. Uh, let's go through the papers then. 
I was going to say there's only one story in town, but actually the front and back of the Irish Independent is the only newspaper that doesn't have any real mention at all, or no mention at all, of John Delaney. Uh, the headline on the back of the Irish Independent, Van Gran open to legends return, coaching contact with O'Gara and O'Connell as he weighs up backroom changes. This is sort of the dream team that everyone has spoken about over the last couple of years. Johan Van Gran has left the door open for a surprise monster return for Ronan O'Gara and Paul O'Connell. The South African who last week penned a contract contract extension that will keep Matt Thoman parked at 2022 is considering a coaching revamp. Current assistants Jerry Flannery and Felix Jones out of contract at the end of the season and new deals for the pair have not been announced. Now Felix Jones and Jerry Flannery both seem to be incredibly highly rated by people down at Munster but maybe they have their own head coaching ambitions that uh, may be part of the reason that they haven't signed new deals. O'Gara, as we know, is down with Crusaders in New Zealand. O'Connell has said he's leaving Stade Francais at the end of the season. Van Graan told Virgin Media Sport, we've got to sort out the guys that we currently have. We as a coaching group are working very well together and obviously I came in mid last season. Everyone's enjoying it. We're always open to adding additional personnel. Nothing's ever impossible. Paulie's doing some great work with Stade Francais and he's finishing up. Raj has been absolutely fantastic at Crusaders and he's possibly the most sought after coach in the world, if I'm not mistaken. I've been in constant contact with them and there's a lot of quality coaches all over the world who will do what's best for Munster. He's been in constant contact with them. That must be great for Munster fans, the prospects of those two um, lads stepping back in. You know, hugely successful as players. That transition always isn't an easy one. Mm. It's not a given. You're so successful as players that it's going to be the case. As a coach, different skill sets involved. We, we all know that, but from the outside looking in, some of the stature of Paul O'Connor, listen to him talk, obviously, of the last year, so he does it quite a lot of commentary, very impressive, and Ronan Gara as well, so great to see those It lads. would show a lot of, a huge amount of self-confidence for Van Gran as well, to bring the two of them yeah. in no, it's alongside a great point. him, because obviously yeah. they are the dream team, and we've had Ronan on plenty of times, he was on yesterday, and at road shows talking about, as you say, like it's this fairy tale I think for Munster fans that they come back and the glory days return and they win Heineken Champions Cups again and it's not always that straightforward. But if they're there, the second results go even slightly off for Munster, it's get the two boys in. So for Van Graan to sort of face that up and go, listen, if yeah. it's the best thing for Munster and I'm not going to be getting as much of the credit as maybe I would have been if it's too... Lesser profile players, looking if it's the best for Munster, I'll go with it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, I'd like to say that from a coach, could easily go the other way, feel threatened or intimidated by those people coming in, but he's obviously, you know, he, he realises everybody's a winner, players, players of that calibre uh, come into the squad. And, and you're right, it doesn't guarantee trophies, Heineken Cups, etc., but it gar guarantees that those players, that kind of coaching group, would certainly uh, get the very best out of the, the players available to them. The other story out of Munster yesterday was that Joey Carberry is almost certain to miss their Champions Cup semi-final against Saracens on Saturday. Tyler Blayendal expected to start at that half. We'll have that game live for you on Saturday's Off the Ball. Also on the back of the Independent, new Nike deal can make Tiger the richest athlete in history. He is going to be rewarded for his Masters triumph with a new deal worth in excess of €170 million. Euro. So he can start closing the gap again on Michael Jordan as the wealthiest sports star in history. Following a costly divorce, Forbes estimated Wood's net worth at 670 million euro in 2016, but uh, Jordan was at 1.2 billion euro, but he may well start to catch up now after that Masters win. They always stuck with him, didn't they? Uh, Nike, that contract, they, they never ditched it, did they? I mean, m most of their sponsors uh, uh, ran to the hills, but I think Nike, I think they actually, did they stick with him through, the, through those times? Yeah. They did, and uh, I'd say Nike were celebrating ahead of that final round on Sunday because they had Tony Finau, Francesco Molinari, Tiger Woods was the final three ball, wow. all three wearing their Nike hats. And <laughs> also in that, in addition, Hollywood filmmakers are expected to come in with offers to chronicle Woods' recovery from oh, 1199th no. in the world rankings, having been close to quitting as he was treated for sex addiction and arrested at the wheel of his car with a cocktail of drugs in his system. The Masters was huge for Nike and don't, huge for Tiger. Don't say Will Smith. Please don't say Will Smith. <laughs> Please, God, no. I mean, that's a massive mistake. He's already done, Ali. Why is it a massive mistake? Listen, that's a massive it's gone at all. Said it. Sex, drugs, rock and roll. You said it yourself, Muhammad Ali. Funny enough, Will, Will Smith. Yes, but that's the point in, making. Yeah, it's a farce. I didn't even bother to go and say it because he just can't How's it beat. A farce? You can't, you can't beat the, 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 the life of the man, the, the, the life that Woods has lived uh, on TV in front of us, day in, day, uh, month in, month out. You can't replicate that. But you, if you... You if, can't better it. If you it. can condense it into a nice... Entertaining no. two hours. God, no. 
That's a massive mistake. What? We've been living through it. I mean, we've been living through the Tiger, uh, Tiger Woods uh, episodes, life and times ah, of the past me. couple of years, uh, sporting and obviously off the field as well. To try and condense that into a film, throw it, top Hollywood act, it's just car, car crash stuff. I, don't, I can't believe they Did even Did you not watch Bohemian anymore. Rhapsody? No. But this is my point. But people of that stature, you can't replicate it. They're, the kind of charisma so what you do, you go out of here, you go out of here, right? And you watch there's a YouTube video of Remy Malik, who plays Freddie Mercury. So Freddie Mercury, Queen, live at Wembley, and they show Remy Malik side by side, and it is perfect. No, it's not. What, what about the younger people who don't not remember Tiger '97? You know, this, this generation there barely even remember the sex scandal. Oh, well, maybe so. Oscar winner well, written all over yeah, it. Yeah, take your point. Maybe exception for people, but for those of us who has, and we're of that that age group. So, do you just, not watch any? It's a waste of time. Now, that, that, no, those any biographies. People, those people, and very, very rarely, actually, those people in particular, those high-profile people who've actually lived through it ourselves. Well, no, there's there's no point. I think it's absolutely pointless <clears throat> for somebody maybe a couple of centuries ago. You know, high pro. Did you watch Sully? A politician. What? Did you watch Sully? The guy who landed the plane <laughs> on the Hudson. That was quite entertaining. Well, uh, what wasn't it? Uh, Tom Hanks died. Oh, it's Tom Hanks. Seven out of ten, isn't he? Seven out. <laughs> Doesn't the the Have a think about it now over the next hour. What, about, there must be one good biography you enjoyed. Yeah, but if somebody ever haven't got a huge amount of knowledge on the right. person in particular or his life, uh, his life and times, and it's actually a bit more education, you'll learn a little bit more about the person. But there's nothing Tiger Woods, certainly Freddie Freddie Mercury, you need to. It's there. It's all out there. You know, they live their lives in the public domain. So, the Wolf of Wall Street. You enjoyed that? Uh, yeah. Okay. I like the Caprio. To be honest with you, I think. Caprio is a fine, fine actor. So that maybe would. Yeah, I, I did watch a little bit of it, but. Yeah, but you're talking. That, that's you're going. You didn't that, know the story, is that it? No, yeah, I knew a bit of this story. It wouldn't it, uh, interest me greatly though, as opposed to those uh, figures that you've been talking. Woods, Ali. I mean, you know. You know the story. It's chalk and cheese, isn't it? Right. You've got to stay away from them. I think you just got to stay away from them. You people. can't improve in their documentary. Story. A documentary of, of sorts, fair enough. But an actual rolling Will Smith and oh, come on, Fresh Prince. Here we go. <laughs> No, Other no actors sense. are available. Doesn't have to be. There's a whole new young generation coming through. Any of them. What have you got there in the examiner? What have I got? Obviously, uh, picture uh, John Delaney probably sums up his uh, present uh, predicament, certainly from uh, jo uh, John's point of view. Uh, back of the uh, sun. Uh, just a caption there to Troy Deeney. Big mistake last night. Uh, cost his team and a big win for us. And a lot of question marks about them. Their ability to go away from home between now and the end of the season and get the amount of points needed for a Champions League place. Well, proved the point uh, last night. This is an interesting one. Uh, Rashford being linked to a £100 million move mm. uh, to Barca. I can't see that happening myself. He's got two years left on his contract. This now. is in a lot of the papers today. Oh, yeah, Marcus Rashford. No, I, I'm is not buying million it. not an absolute bargain? It, well, it is for a start, but I don't, personally, I don't think that young is going anywhere. I think he's Manchester uh, through and through. And as long as United look after him this summer and are fair in terms of contract negotiation, I don't think he's going anywhere. He's the future in Manchester United Football Club. They have to build their team around him. And uh, yeah, again, just a, a quote from uh, Solskjaer on the Herald. Uh, United have belief, you're talking about the spirit in 99, that type of thing. Uh, it'd be interesting, his team talk to be a fly in the wall before the game. And obviously, Brian has been very vocal in terms of <coughs> John Delaney's position. But not just that, I know it was, uh, uh, Brian has been keen to broaden the conversation out in terms of the FA uh, board as well. And, and uh, question their kind of capabilities moving forward, saying uh, pretty much everybody's got to go. It's got to be the board with John. I understand this point. I don't know the FAI board uh, individually in terms of their individual qualities, in terms of their uh, experience mm. uh, in the game, even business experience, that type of thing. Probably Brian does, probably knows individually these type of people. So, Well, from what you've been following over the last week or so and from the committee hearing and all that and all the revelations that have been coming out about expenses and just the general running of the FAI, yeah. do you not feel for the betterment of Irish football we just need a clean break? We need to think it up all over again? Yeah, no, I can understand that. I'm always a little bit maybe the baby out of the bathwater, though, uh, uh, to be honest with you. Easy thing to say the whole board must go. Is it 10 board members, is there? Like, John's got to go, the board members got to go. And I understand the argument, and I think probably it's, it's, it's looking that way 
uh, at the moment. Now, if that is the case, I mean, if those 10 board members are proved to be pretty much incompetent, is that what people are saying? Well, of course they uh, uh, have to go. But if there's a couple of people in there who with their experience on the board over the last couple of years, potentially you think, well, actually, uh, no, I, I have a bit of respect for those people. They have good understanding of the game, good, uh, business acumen, whatever. Yeah, we can keep them. We can bring some fresh uh, faces in as well and we can add to it. Yeah, uh, I have no problem with that. I'm just a little bit that sweep and everybody's got to go, we, we start again. I can understand it and I can understand the arguments and I think they are, they are, they are fair arguments and I genuinely think that's probably the way uh, uh, things are going. Do you not think they're all tarnished by association? That what we saw in front of the Oireachtas Committee yeah. last Wednesday with the insight into how the FAI had been run, into the lack of knowledge, it seems, of an awful lot of people on that board as to how the FAI was been run, yeah. would suggest that no matter what their qualities are, and I'm sure as you say there are people in there who have yeah. things to offer, that by association with the yeah. what looks as though it's soon going to be the previous regime, that actually yeah. while they're there there's still always going to be doubts about who's running the show. Yeah, I can understand that, but as far as we kept two or three board members, they wouldn't be in a huge position of power. A new CEO comes in, another six or seven, you know, board members, and mm. that those board members who stay aren't going to uh, yield a huge amount uh, of influence. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to, uh, to see how it pans out. Um, uh, yeah, that kind of this picture of a kind of a small cabal in there, the kind of FIO board has kind of been put out there, and I and like I say, I, I can understand that. I suppose if you're one of those FIO board members and you felt well, this is wrong. Things need to change uh, here. I feel as if I should speak. That's probably that's probably not an, an easy environment to go and uh, do that to be vocally uh, critical of your of your kind of board members and certainly well, your. Well, that, well, that's your, the point, isn't CEO. it? That that's well, the point. That well, no, uh, clearly yeah. there was an environment that if yeah. they were unhappy and if there were parts of the organisation yeah. they were unhappy about, it, they didn't seem to be able to yeah. find their voice or have an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, or certainly cho are either chose not to use it. Yeah, that's right. And that stunts the growth of any any type of organisation. You need pe people need to be vocal, uh, offer uh, opinions, uh, criticisms even, like, you know what I mean, fall out with each other. That's how thing, uh, things invariably get better in a kind of uh, group environment. You need that, uh, that type of healthy environment. People need to be comfortable coming out and offering those opinions. If that hasn't be, been the case over mm. the last number of years, of course that's, uh, that's wrong and we're going to see those changes. It looks as if we're going to see those uh, changes implemented going forward, hopefully for the better. So the back page of the Irish Daily Star, Delaney, embattled ex-CEO, clings on to power, Kerr, board needs to go. Let's hear from Brian Kerr, actually, I think, while we're going through the back pages, because these quotes from Brian Kerr that are in a lot of the papers were from last night's Off the Ball. He was talking to Joe about the statement that John Delaney is to temporarily step aside from his role as FAI Executive Vice President. Well, also you must remember that the majority of these board members were part of a special EGM a few years ago that changed the rule yeah. away from people had to leave the board when they were 70, that they couldn't, they couldn't go forward once again. And that was a UEFA rule that was introduced across all the, um, all the countries, uh, all the participating countries in UEFA competitions. And the FAI, and that board containing uh, Mr. Murray and Mr. Cody and several of the, the current members who are still there, they chose to make that decision at that time and as usual. And now we have a situation where they've got this 79. As we look at the evidence of Mr. Murray at, at the Dáil Committee yeah. the other day when he, he said they had one bank account and we discovered later that he had 24 bank accounts. It's not like he was even out by two or three or four or five. He yeah. was out by 23. So, you know, that, that shows the limitations of the board. Yeah. And when that decision at the EG was an incorrect decision, got away with it. And that's why I've maintained for many years that the association has, has lacked leadership. And I think that's been, mm. that's been very obvious to a lot of people that were close to the action. But it's become um, particularly obvious after the behaviour in the last couple of weeks and, and, and more than ever when they appeared at the Dáil Committee. They got a corporate governance one. I, I'm not surprised at you being able to sum it up in a couple of very brief sentences. Do your business properly with no message. Yeah, basically. <laughs> you know, so as it goes on, I mean, it, it looks like it's, it's the end of this era and there's considerable change is going to have to come. I don't think people, uh, the general public or the football I won't use the, 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 the phrase that, 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 that the, the FAI had bundled around for years, but the people who are involved in football and people who are supporters of football will not accept 
this board making decisions for football in Ireland in the future. Some strong comments as always from Brian Kerr on last night's Off the Ball about the ongoing saga at the FEI. If you missed any of this yesterday evening, so there were long meetings yesterday out at the Carlton at the airport, an FEI board meeting. A sort of expectation had developed all weekend that because of text messages he had sent to his friends that John Delaney was going to resign. The statement from the FEI said that the, after meeting in Dublin, they met with John Delaney. John Delaney has offered to voluntarily step aside from carrying out his role as executive vice president with immediate effect pending the completion of an independent investigation by the association into issues of concern to the board. Honorary Secretary Michael Cody, Honorary Treasurer Eddie Murray both voluntarily resigned from the board. So that obviously then raised far more questions because it was such an ambiguous statement about what John Delaney was doing. It didn't even say that they had accepted his offer to step aside as executive vice president. And uh, there was then a letter that we've seen that the FAI sent to Sport Ireland in response to the seven, eight questions from last Wednesday's committee that they said they couldn't answer at the time, but they'd come back. Uh, they did come back then late last night. And in that letter, they said, you'll have seen today that Mr. Delaney has stepped aside from his role as executive vice president. Part of the uh, maybe the most interesting aspect of those answers to the questions that were left unanswered was that... Uh, one of the questions was, why were other bank accounts not utilised in the absence of the €100,000 loan? The FAI say at the time the association was provided with the €100,000 loan from John Delaney, it had utilised all available funding across its bank accounts. So across its 24 bank accounts, the FAI had used all its funding before John Delaney gave them that €100,000. Uh, still a lot of questions, and still one question actually outstanding that wasn't answered in this, which was, who signed off on the statement which said that the board all knew about that €100,000 loan. It's since turned out that only three people knew about that €100,000 loan. That was asked. The FAI said they would get back with an answer to that, but it seems that they are still waiting for an answer. Uh, the Joint Committee on Transport, Tourism and Sport meet again today. Uh, John Tracy and Sport Ireland are going to be up in front of them. Minister for Sport Shane Ross is going to be up in front of them. So this still has a long way to run. And I guess you can look at this in two ways, it seems. John Delaney told friends over the weekend that he was going to offer his resignation. That hasn't happened. So did the uh, FAI refuse to accept his resignation as they don't want such a key figure in this saga leaving the association without answering all the questions that need answering? So therefore he temporarily steps aside. Or somehow do the FAI and John Delaney think that they can weather the storm and ride this out and that eventually we will get fatigue? We're a month into this already. <coughs> I think we've got five different reports at the moment. We're, we, do we want to do a poll? I think we should do a poll really. Or we should definitely have a vote on what's your favourite FAI report. Is it the Mazars report, the Grant Thornton report, the FAI governance report, the latest independent investigation into issues of concern of the board? Or maybe it is going to wait and see what the Office of Director of Corporate Enforcement reveals. Yeah, no, I reached that uh, ceiling of mental fatigue, I think, uh, uh, some time ago. I'm not even in the country, like, experiencing this on a day-to-day -day basis. So. I don't think other people have. Is the I, I, I actually would have thought if we got a month, five weeks into this, that there would have been a certain amount of fatigue. But because of the FEI's appearance and their attitude at that committee, I think people I think in this they, country are right. very invested into what happens next, and particularly what happens with John Delaney. The star then, so as we heard there from Brian Kerr's statements, it's on the front and the back. Ex-CEO steps aside but won't quit after 23 days in his new role. Fifth probe launched as two quit FAI board. And inside, they, like a lot of the papers, they've unanswered questions that they want to go through. And they have a lot of analysis of it, including from Eamon Dumphy, who uh, talks about maybe what happens next and who the potential replacements are as CEOs. He says various names have been touted around and they aren't convincing. Delaney became a celebrity administrator, so the last thing you need is another celebrity like Niall Quinn. Uh, well, yeah, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't agree with that. I think that that's too easy. I think you have to look at the attributes of each in the individual uh, candidate. And I don't think you can rule uh, Niall out just because he was a high-profile. Uh, football player for Ireland. That that seems that seems an act of stupidity, to be honest with you. You know, put put that to the side. Uh, have a look. at The man is uh, experienced. What he can uh, bring to the position. Percy, Percy for me, I, I think somebody who has a grounding uh, within sports, w uh, within the game, uh, can only be an advantage. I think it's it's one thing which should be taken uh, into consideration. Not the only thing. Clearly, there's a huge respect. Someone with with a with a business background and some experience in a position like this. Obviously, not people will point to Niles. Uh, 
uh, position up at uh, Sunderland mm. CEO whatever position you want to tag uh, up there very competent I was there for the year at the time when uh, when, when Niall was there so yeah I think it's too, in some respects it's too easy people so a lot of people would have Niall Quinn straight in there uh, so, uh, I, I wouldn't I think he's, he's, a, he's a somebody who should be under consideration uh, potentially somebody who should be spoken to if you're talking about all those players ex-football players who potentially could make an argument for probably Niall uh, would would be the obvious one, but then there'd be people with no uh, sporting background whatsoever, uh, from a purely business uh, background, mm. who you'd imagine would have a big effect coming in, and clearly there'd be a number of th- those contenders as well. So I wouldn't rule somebody out because he hasn't got the uh, that kind of sporting background. But I certainly wouldn't rule somebody like Noel Quinn out because of the fact that he has. I don't think Noel is somebody who actually gravitates towards the camera. He's kind of ego driven, you know. He desperately needs to be in front of the, uh, the camera, that, uh, that type of thing. Noel's pretty much comfortable in his own skin. I think he's been pretty vocal of late in terms of how he feels about a couple of issues, the League of Ireland in particular, which I think we're all interested in. I think in terms of the marriage between the FAI and the League of Ireland, that clearly hasn't been mm. uh, has has had its problems, and that's key for me going forward as well because it's our national game. It's uh, it's the one which took uh, should take pre- uh, precedence over anything else. International football, I understand, but we've got to find a solution to the League of Ireland uh, going future. So hopefully, the new man coming in, that will be uh, foremost in his mind. And I guess the key thing there is if we are getting to the stage where we rip it up and start again, and who knows the way this is developing? Maybe as as it rumbles on, we look at the FAI and wonder if the FAI has a future. If we need to completely rip it up and start with a new Football Ireland organisation where you yeah. maintain the key people within the FAI, the many good people who work there, but you come up with a totally new board, much like they did at the Olympic Council. And I suppose it's so set in our brain that the CEO is this yeah. key front of house, very public figure. It doesn't necessarily need to be the case, actually. As you say, it could be a business person who has a very good background, who then surrounds themselves with a lot of good footballing brains from the League of Ireland, from the women's football, from a role in there for somebody like Brian Kerr or maybe for Niall Quinn doesn't necessarily need to be CEO but it doesn't mean that a lot of those key voices can't have a strong influence yeah no absolutely yeah you're absolutely right uh, yeah w- w- whatever the, uh, the solution is wherever you know it doesn't have to be a CEO it doesn't have to be the kind of a uh, a uh, natural pyramid that we're used to seeing like in business in, in big exactly, corporate yeah. organisations so whatever the solution is as long as you've got the right people in, in key areas of the organisation for me that's absolutely key and you're right somebody who's going to listen to the opinion uh, football people who've got a good knowledge of the game have the best interest of the game at heart you've mentioned uh, Brian in particular that's clearly the case we know how passionate Brian is about the game over here particularly League of Ireland and, and I'll mention League of Ireland again because I think it's had a, a, a rough time of it the League of Ireland over the past couple of years but there's shoots of optimism there the League of Ireland this year it's going to be a very competitive some uh, some v- outstanding young players in the league always has been but getting probably you getting were here on Saturday Kenny Johnny Ward told you it's over Shamrock Rovers of the yeah, league won no it's over I think, the title, I think they're having their parade out in Tallinn next week <laughs> but that's the, that's a good thing Rovers have come to the fore we've had Dundalk and uh, uh, Cork obviously the past couple of years Rovers coming to the fore Derry have made a great start to the season so some great stories there and some just underneath that I'm talking about the, the quality of uh, football and a young uh, young players in particular uh, coming to the fore and you can point to the underage structures mm. there in particular a lot of criticism FAI and stuff but in terms of the stru- uh, infrastructure they're putting in place uh, underneath that in say, 1970s, 15s uh, leagues and, to- and uh, things like this trying to target that, that young talent around the country and uh, get them within the system good quality coaching all those type of things have been happening slowly uh, behind the scenes over the past couple of years uh, Nathan so yeah so I, th- I think as much as a little bit dispirited at the moment a lot of neg- negativity for ob- uh, for obvious reasons for me the future still is bright and, and that's the reason for it because of the, uh, the qualities that I see uh, and certainly not just in the international teams and the underage set a lot of good stories there under 19s under 17s mm. been hugely successful uh, of late and the League of Ireland as well the talent pool within the League of Ireland we've got to help those clubs out uh, and help those young players as well. Yeah, and we'll have those conversations over the next couple of weeks as well as to where Irish football goes next. In fairness to Dunphy, he's only got about 200 words, I'd say, in the uh, in the star. He still manages to have a couple of very, very good digs. So obviously Niall Quinn, celebrity. In his newspaper column, Stephen Hunt talked of needing someone with a background in the game and between the ages of 35 and 45. Maybe he was just trying to put himself in the frame. Hunty next CEO. Does he get the Kenny Cunningham endorsement? I thought, I'd be surprised if Stevens putting himself in the uh, in line for that. Would you? 
<laughs> yeah, I just think it's one of them. We I don't like to hear that, to be honest with you. The one thing about the John thing, John might well go. I think he, he the, the fact is he probably w uh, will do. But I, I, I'm a little bit kind of, you know, somebody who's in a, you can see somebody there in a corner, you know, and it's it's it's, it's looking bad. And John's had a high profile uh, position for, for a long period of time. Obviously, he loves the position. He's got a lot of passion for the game. A lot of stories about around the country doing a lot of individual clubs and all that uh, uh, type of thing. So, so there's clearly that that side to to as well. I'm not yeah. making excuses here at all. So, I, I I wouldn't get any um, I wouldn't get any joy to see like J uh, John being shown the door and literally being ki be kicked out of the job. I wouldn't get any huge satisfaction with that. And when I hear some of the comments coming out, I don't like to hear some of it. I, I accept some of the criticism. Uh, as long as it's made in the in the right manner, and it's coming from the right place. Like like I said, Brian uh, there puts a very sound argument. Uh, other people will. When it doesn't get personal, and it's about the uh, the, the association, about football, and what's mm. what's the best what's best for that. That that's absolutely fine. I have no problem with that. Don't like it when it when, when it gets uh, too personal. Uh, he shouldn't get it. There's ulterior motives. I don't want him to get it because it is. You know, what I mean, there's personal things come into it. You know, we should be bigger than that. Push all of that to the side and let's make the decision which are right going forward. Uh, for the game, for the game in Ireland, uh, pure, purely and simple. Personalities really shouldn't come into it. Yeah, it's been personality driven, though. I guess is the problem that for the yeah, last yeah, decade. Yeah, more, yeah, it can so. be. Yeah, I know it's an easy. That's an easy thing uh, for me to say. But really, that uh, that should be the case. If you have the best interest of the game, that that that's what should be driving it. Uh, finally, the front page of the Irish Examiner: Entire FAI board urged to resign uh, after John Delaney's decision to step aside. The majority of Oireachta Sports Committee members will demand that Sports Minister Shane Ross and Sport Ireland remove the FAI board at a crucial meeting today, saying the FAI needs to be swept clean to restore trust. However, despite the demands, the Irish Examiner understands Sport Ireland will tell TDs it cannot remove every board member without risking legal action or potential FIFA sanctions against the Irish football team under political interference rules. So uh, it will be an interesting afternoon. Obviously, we'll be across all that on offtheball.com. We've seen the opening statements from... Uh, John Tracy and from Sport Ireland where they talk about the restoration of funding and what needs to happen including in that is an audit of the sporting body's governance and financial control and that certainly looks to be where this is heading that there will be a full audit of everything that's been going on at the FAI over the last few years. Uh, you can comment as always if you're watching us this morning on OTBAM on any of our social channels if you have any questions for Kenny we're going to talk Manchester United Barcelona in a moment but we've been talking sporting biographies and Kenny's just general disdain for them would Kenny watch a biography of Kenny Cunningham, an Oscar winner for sure? Oh, Who would play Kenny Cunningham? Who would play Kenny Cunningham? I was going to say, you wouldn't stress Jason that out. Statham. What, what's Will, that? Will Smith. <laughs> Jason Statham. Oh, no, it's never going to happen. They need my there? permission for that. Do you need actually somebody's? Uh, no, but all they need is as, as as we did the night of our road show with Peter Schmeichel. Right. We they just play the uh, greatest hits of some of the best Premier League goals of all time where you're there as sort of best supporting actor. <laughs> so yeah, Beckham, exactly. Beckham's uh, from the halfway line floats over your head. Paolo Di Canio's unbelievable volley. Ball it's floats over your head. You literally head the ball to Tony Yeboah. Best supporting. It's best, best supporting actor really, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, what oh, about Raging Bull? Happen. Fantastic film. Oh. Give Raging Bull? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, that takes it back to a time uh, some decades ago. Again, I wouldn't be overly so familiar with the individual. Biography. Uh, yeah, exactly. I wouldn't have. So you're actually getting a little bit of information, and then obviously the actor, the actor himself, like, you know, one of the best of his best of his generation, not of all time. So Kevin is one of those watching on YouTube. Ask Kenny, can he remember his only goal as a pro for Millwall? I uh, would well, see Kevin. Who's this? Ke Kevin? Uh, just just I, a not Kevin, sure. not just the Kevin. Kevin, not, not the not Kevin. Kevin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> now that you mention well, it, uh, statistically, Kevin's not. He's not correct. When he says my only goal, he's actually the only goal into the correct goal. He's in, no, no, he's actually incorrect. So okay. I'm going to bat oh, that right, one back goals? to him. I'm going to bat that one back to Kevin. Tell him to go dig a little bit wow. deeper and find out a little bit more information about my career. Are we allowed to bring up uh, one of our favourite stats of all time? That yeah. Kenny Cunningham has played more games than any other outfield player in Premier League history yeah. without scoring a goal. I'd pretty much gone away with that for a long period of time, and I think it was Tony Hibbert. I remember Tony Hibbert had, popped yeah, up with a goal, with a goal, and then suddenly he was out there. Who the hell else is? Surely nobody has gone this long without. And obviously, we came uh, a <laughs> bubble to the surface. How did you never score a goal? Did you not go up for corners? No, I stopped going up for corners very early in my career. Why? 
I, I just didn't Frank like being. Hair. I didn't like being too far away from me. Go, <laughs> go to point out the obvious. Something horrible could happen if I went up. No, but I did. I had that. I did have that little bit of a defensive mindset. I didn't like being too far. I didn't like right. being ahead of the ball. If you generally watch me, even Jordan, I had this thing about. I, I didn't like being ahead of the ball. I had. I wanted. I felt as if I could affect the game. I was behind the ball and something happened. I could maybe get back and stop an opposition attack. And when I got ahead of the ball and caught. And the distance between me and me got too big. Yeah, it was a bit of a... I, I, yeah, I didn't enjoy it. You call it a defensive mindset, call it what you want, but I was very comfortable. I was very comfortable uh, sitting on the halfway line now for so you that. sacrificed your own personal glory for the No, team. I didn't. I'll tell you another thing as well. I wasn't much good. I wasn't... I was a reasonable ahead of the ball, but in terms of attacking the ball, uh, Nathan, the opposition goal, not that real kind of aggressive. No, I wasn't particularly good. It wouldn't have been one of my strengths. I was better at kind of pushing the opposition centre forward under the ball and maybe uh, heading the ball clear. I found that a bit easier. 335 Premier League appearances for Kenny Cunningham. Zero goals. <laughs> You're right, actually. Well yeah, yeah. The only goal 16 came. assists, though. 16 assists? I don't know if they count on the Tony Ebola goal as an assist. Uh, certainly did it, can you? Certainly did it, can you? Surely. <laughs> I'm sure, I still think it, it skimmed... Had a bit of hair back then. So All right, it's a big night in the Champions League. Manchester United up against Barcelona. We're going to look ahead to that in a moment. We're going to get the tactics board out for Kenny. But first, here's more from Brian Kerr on last night's Off the Ball, discussing what he called the FAI's totally unsatisfactory statement on John Delaney's future. It sounds typical of the sort of statements that we've had from them lately, which are confusing, uh, unclear. Like, uh, what I'm wondering, does it mean that he, he hasn't really resigned until he is the results of the investigation. And um, as you said, we don't know which, which one it is. So, it, 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 look, it's another one of these totally unsatisfactory statements coming from the FAI. Mm. And once again, we see a lack of transparency, a lack of efficiency, and even putting out a clear statement that people can understand in clear English. What's happened then is a whole host of... Um people trying to decipher it and interpret it. Like Stuart Kilholy, the PFAI solicitor, he is of the opinion that Delaney didn't offer a resignation. And so he has tweeted, clearly the FAI board received legal advice that in the absence of a resignation, they would need to carry out an investigation before taking further action. And he says, legally, that's probably correct, but it's a disaster for an already beleaguered organisation that needs closure on this fiasco. So Kilholy is of the opinion that Delaney did not offer his resignation and therefore the board would have had legal advice to the effect that they need to carry out an investigation before taking further action against John Delaney. That is one interpretation, obviously, and it's just an interpretation. That could be the case. That could be the case, but, you know, Stuart, Stuart Galihuli is just one solicitor. Mm. Um, other solicitors might have another view. They might think that the statement looks like something that came out from the Soviet era from uh, the USSR or Romania. Mm. Well, fair play to Stuart for being able to make a, a, um, an interpretation on it which gives the FAI some credit. Yeah, Brian Kerr there speaking to Joe on last night's Off the Ball. You can listen back to that full interview on offtheball.com uh, on the Football Show podcast as well. Dan McDonald talks you through the story of the last 24 hours. The story of the next 24 hours on the pitch is very much going to be about what happens at the Camp Nou this evening. Manchester United travelling to take on Barcelona. They are 1-0 down from the first leg. But can they invoke the spirit of 99? <laughs> How many times has Ole Gunnar Solskjaer spoken about the spirit of 99? Yeah, yeah. Do you think he needs to move on with his life? Uh, yeah, I, I imagine he's not re uh, repeating that. Um, the line, the line that uh, I saw yesterday about how he refused to park in the manager's car parking space because he thinks that's reserved for Alex Ferguson. Yeah. Is that true? I, pre I presumed it was someone taking the piss. Yeah, it's a little bit embarrassing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, look, he's got the contract now, like you know. So yeah, I, I wouldn't mind him saying. I can understand though, to 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 a certain extent, you have to pay a little bit of homage, but no, yeah, but not too much. He's his own man. Now. He needs to just get on and look forward rather rather than too much behind, him, particularly the shadow of Alex Ferguson. Is there anything in it that footballers these days are, are so technically skillful? They're all at when you get to a Champions League quarter final, everybody's at such a high level, and they're so tactically aware. 
that actually the, tapping into the emotional side of it can actually make a difference. No, that, I think that, yeah, yeah. No, I think it can. And yeah, it's 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 not an easy thing. It's a, it's a case of like providing a bit of inspiration to your players. I think particularly maybe in the moments before they go uh, they go onto the pitch, you could even argue maybe team meeting the, the night before the game might be a better thing rather than maybe charging up the players too close to kick off. Yeah, maybe that, that type of team talk is best presented to the players maybe the night before or even uh, the morning of the game, particularly at a club like Manchester United. You, know, you hear about the kind of traditions yeah. uh, in a football club. To a certain extent, I don't like to hear it too much. A group of players, for me, it should be all about yourselves and what you can achieve as a group, not particularly looking behind you all the time at previous players and previous generations of players. But I think Manchester United you know, is probably a, a little bit uh, different in terms. I think present players can draw a little bit of inspiration from the kind of the days, the achievements of players of, of Manchester United teams uh, of the past. You've obviously mentioned, now you've laughed a little bit, the spirit in 99. But that type of thing, I think that's clearly what Solskjaer is uh, trying to do, but not too much of it. Because at the end of the day, it's all about these players, ta the tactical yeah. setup of the team on the night and the individual qualities of, of whatever team that Solskjaer puts on the pitch tonight. That's going to be the most important. So let's talk about that and how they'll set up tactically. The team news for Manchester United is that Luke Shaw is suspended and Ander Herrera and Eric Bailly are both missing from the squad through injury. So Manchester United are in blue here. How do you expect them to set up? Uh, not in blue. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in a blue card. I don't expect Barcelona to be in white and I don't expect the ball to be red that's the first thing I'm going to say I'm not going to name names but I'm, I'm blaming Joe our viewers. I'm blaming Joe on that Manchester United for the benefit of this tactics board <laughs> they are in white now blue, blue. Manchester United you, you're, you're even getting confused I'm getting confused Manchester United are in blue Barcelona in white the ball is this red thing I do remember Manchester United blue away kit over, over the years is there is away kit at the years? moment not blue is there one of them blue at the moment I haven't seen it some Last years ago third kit was blue third kit was it exactly yeah I think it's interesting exactly how Sosa goes about it no uh, surprises Barcelona that kind of back four PK Longley two full backs probably Semedo Alba that narrow midfield three Busquets at the base uh, we're presuming Rakitic and maybe continue Coutinho, uh, Dembele, Messi, Suarez, they could flip. You know, basic kind of 4-3-3. Three, three. You know, I could match this very easily, a 4-3-3, three, three, a 4-5-1. Four, might potentially throw um, uh, Rashford off the line, Martial, maybe Lukaku up top. So you got a back for a blank of five and one striker up the pitch. That'd be, that'd be an obvious thing to do in terms of not giving Barcelona any obvious channels to go forward. But what I like about Schalzkoy and what he's had some success with, going with a kind of a 4-4-2, a, four, four, a back four, uh, take your pick, uh, Lindelof, Smalling, your two full backs. A diamond shaped in midfield and a front two, but split strikers. Not a normal kind of front two, but split strikers operating really off the shoulders at the two centre halves. What that does for you and what they've had some success with, I'm thinking about Arsenal in the FA Cup uh, at the Emirates. Uh, this is the setup they went with against Tottenham at Wembley. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Lingard in particular is key. Playing at the top, uh, the top of this diamond, you could argue Matic. Uh, Pogba certainly off the left and maybe McTominay or Fred off the right hand side what that does Nate makes you very strong down the middle of the pitch we know Barcelona Messi dropping in Suarez coming in off the line finding those little pockets of space when it makes you very strong look at those four midfield players within the confines of the 18 yard mm -hmm. box back four narrowed up not easy to play in those central areas which Barcelona like to do what that does of course is that forces the opposition team down the sides you open yourself up down the sides so easy for Barcelona to get the ball to their full backs in these positions but I think if you're an opposition team you wanted Barcelona to have the ball you'd rather their full backs have the ball in these areas rather than Messi, Suarez, Coutinho getting the ball in central areas of the pitch So you're being a realist if you're Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and realising that you can't stop every facet of Barcelona's play every attacking option what you're trying to do is obviously limit Lionel Messi and if that means letting Alaba and Semedo roam forward In wide areas fine. exactly and I guess does that then open so this is the thing, Is this is the interesting thing about the actual uh, split striker scenario. So generally, if you played with two orthodox wide men, you expect your wide men to get back with the full backs. You'd leave a lone striker maybe uh, high up the pitch. Not a huge amount of counter-attacking opportunities there when you're playing with 2v1. But by keeping your split strikers here and not asking them to go back with the opposition full backs, allowing the full backs to travel here, asking your wide men Pogba to come across and double up with your full back on this side of the pitch. Everybody shuffles across. Basically, you're potentially giving yourself 2v2 situations here on the counter 
attack because at Barcelona try and play clever balls on the inside here and you're nice and compact and you win that ball back maybe Matic slides across wins back a ball that's meant to go into Suarez's feet and he looks up immediately he's got the likes of Rashford Lukaku you could argue maybe Martial but those two players immediately receiving the ball and get themselves the potentially, potentially 2v2 situations if you remember the game against Spurs uh, United winning the ball back uh, in this area the, this area of the pitch Pogba I think it was mm. Rashford immediately getting himself onto the shoulder of Vertonghen one ball over the top 1v1 the pace that he has he was in goal so it's a, it's a slightly braver bolder uh, formation in terms of the 4-4-2 the for Manchester United but I think it's worth a gamble tonight they're 1-0 down they could go 4-3-3 I, I could understand it but for me they've already shown that this kind of system uh, quite suits them and it really offers you a a, a, a threat uh, on the on the, on the counter-attack it really does and with someone from like Jesse Lingard operating in this position you could argue well what about Juan Mata maybe in this area of the pitch yeah absolutely but when the ball goes over the head of Lingard in this area of the pitch he gets from there to the edge of the box as quick mm. as anybody Mata can do that so very quickly if these two break 2v2 two two, you're going to find Lingard getting himself running off uh, the shoulder bus case who won't be able to keep up with him and if I think back to Manchester City and Barcelona some years ago now I can't remember you probably know better than me uh, Manchester City beat them over two legs in the second leg at the Etihad uh, they ran all over Barcelona they mm. two, that Manchester City team had too much legs and there is a small weakness in this Barcelona team a look at Busquets a look at PK at centre half if you can get the ball and even run off them mm. you'll run away from them so this shape for me this kind of diamond shape uh, in midfield um, Matic at the base uh, take your pick Pogba McTominay and possibly Lingard I'd love to see this, see how uh, maybe they could hurt uh, Barcelona uh, in this particular shape. And Jesse Lingard's positioning then, because I remember after the game against Spurs, there was a lot of debate about where he actually played. Was he a, a false nine almost playing in a, as a front three or was he playing that yeah. little bit deeper? Do you expect them then to almost just sit on Busquets? And yeah. I'm thinking even of the game between Liverpool and Chelsea five years ago when Mourinho made sure he almost man-mark yeah. the... Yeah. The creator and the the deep lying midfielder. That's is, what is happened. That Lingard's role that he just tries to stop. At times, just gets orchestrating the yeah, game. Yeah, at times, absolutely. Because when they get the ball a little bit deeper, keeper get the ball. The two centre halves are split in these areas. You can send your two centre forwards high up the pitch, and very when you see Busquets drop in between the two centre halves, immediately have somebody who can go and get onto him, immediately attach himself to him. So that's not an easy ball uh, out now for Barcelona, even to to play out from the back. The one problem that potentially might have because they're one 0 down in this game, Barcelona don't have to push. So when Barcelona get the ball into these areas of the pitch, one 0 up. They may, they may think we don't have to force it and they might get a, a, a time in the game but, uh, Manchester United might have to put some pressure onto this uh, full back here they might have to go chasing the game it's going to be very hard for Paul Pogba to do that sometimes the distance is too big for him to get across so the only way Manchester United can come out of this shape if they do have to force it and keep the two centre forwards high up the pitch that's what you want to do you don't want to be dragging Lukaku back onto the, yeah. onto, onto the full back what you do then is you commit one of your full backs you send your full back as that ball has been played from PK to Semedo who's going to be receiving the ball uh, in space generally you send your full back high and wide early to engage that player high up the pitch centre halves come around opposition full back comes across the pitch so now you've got your, your full back operating 15-20 yards in front of your left sided centre half high up the pitch and you look at the at the ball Semedo has and where's the obvious ball Semedo has now on the inside or backwards he hasn't Pogba measly attached himself here uh, to Rakitic and Matic is square there's not an easy ball back to PK because Rashford is keeping himself high up the pitch. Yes, you're opening yourself up a little bit behind the fullback, but as long as everybody's sliding across two centre halves and fullback, you should have a nice compact shape here on the on the inside of the pitch. So if you're going to come out of that orthodox shape, mm. the back forward that I'm talking about, this is how you do it. You send one of your fullbacks high up the pitch. This probably won't see this early in the game, but certainly as the game goes on, still one nil down. They have to force it for me. Keep them too high up the pitch. You send one of your fullbacks higher up the pitch, and this is how you open yourself up. You take more of a calculated risk in terms of going after Barcelona. But those two players for, are key for me. Get enough of possession of the ball to them in these central areas with Barcelona fullbacks high and wide as they usually are. They can really hurt this Barcelona team with Lingard joining in with his pace and dynamism from that kind of uh, position a little bit deeper. And would you have Lukaku ahead of Martial? 
I would in in a, in the two split strikers. I, he really impressed me this summer actually for Belgium. Uh, Martinez played him there. I think it was the game against Brazil. Mm. Played those split strikers. Actually, Martinez done him a couple of times with Lukaku at uh, Everton in high profile games. Yeah, I think he's capable of doing it, uh, Lukaku, because you're not really asking him to drop into too many defensive positions. It's that little people call it a cheating position. That's pr- probably not the right word. Right. But I think everybody understands what they're saying in terms of not coming. They're not coming back. Get back into that orthodox four. So it looks as though. They're, they're not being lazy and they're not tracking. Yeah, exactly. You don't want them to. Yeah, exactly. That's wrong. You want them, but you don't want them to stay up in the centre half either, where you can actually hold them and get a hold. And you want them dropping off into that half and half position between full back and centre half on as he generally maybe doesn't want to come touch toy, he'll drop off. So if the ball is won back, a sloppy little ball onto the inside here, immediately can find these players into their feet. And if not, if one or two pass, and very quickly they can get themselves onto the shoulders of those two centre halves and look to walk to space uh, in behind. So they have had success, but this isn't a case of, oh, yeah. we haven't seen this far as a massive gamble. It has proved successful against good opposition in England, Arsenal, and uh, uh, Tottenham that we've referenced. I know these are a calibre above Barcelona, but I think the same principles apply. And I think if United's way in tonight is, is that pace, the pace, dynamism, energy, athleticism of those. Uh, forward uh, players against the likes of PK and Busquets. That's where they can hurt Barcelona. It's all good stuff, Kenny. Yeah, but I can't talk about good game. We've spoken for ten minutes, and you haven't mentioned. Lionel Messi. Yeah, well, you can't. People talk about man, Mark. Hey, you, you, you can't really. All you can do is suffocate and, mm. and limit his influence on the game. Where, where do you presume Messi is going to play in this Barcelona? There's the front three. Where do you think he's going to play Messi? I think Messi will sort of roam wherever he yeah. wants around here, which. Then the concern, I guess, for Manchester United is that Luke Shaw is out suspended. Uh, Diogo Dalot might play left back. Matteo Darmian might play left back. But this guy, Paul Pogba, yeah. is he going to, if Messi drops in here, does yeah. Pogba have the awareness that when he drops deep, to yeah. go and get close to him? Yeah, well, the advantage of this system, you're basically going to have Matic playing spare mm. in that hole in the midfield position. You know, you'll have Messi, you're talking about Messi dropping into these areas here. When he drops into these areas here, Matt has got to get across and attach himself. To it. Not Paul, Paul, Paul Pogba's job necessary to get himself into those areas. They have the spare man there in, um, in Matic. Messi comes into these little pockets of space. Immediately, Matic has got to get himself uh, attached to him in that area of the pitch. That frees up the left side and centre half. You've got your full back here, Pogba over here. So Matic is key. Uh, those areas which Messi has flown into these areas of the pitch, his responsibility to get across. If he comes into a wide area, uh, Nathan makes a uh, doubles up uh, potentially in this area yeah. of the pitch. Yeah, Pogba will have to get across to a certain point and double up with his full back. Left side of centre half, Matic will be over there. So it's always for me with Messi, it's all about the group. You know, if you're going to negate his influence on the game, it's not an easy thing. You've got to do it collectively, not one person's responsibility. It's almost an, an impossible job. It's about collectively as a group, how you kind of suffocate him and kind of deny him the space, deny him the space to turn and run into open space uh, towards you. So not easy. But this shape for me, with Matic kind of sitting a little bit deeper at the base of that diamond, again, gives you a little bit of an advantage. It gives you enough players in this area of the pitch to try and condense that space where invariably wants, uh, Messi wants to operate. And I guess if Lionel Messi turns up in the night and does what he can do, all the tactics in the world ain't going to save you. No, I understand that, but the, the the best tactics implemented correctly uh, by the players will will certainly help you on a lot of occasions. Messi turns up and has one of those nights. You're absolutely right. He can take the uh, the game away from any team. But Manchester United have to think positively. Have to think about how can they. Uh, take advantage of any potential frailties in this Barcelona team and certainly on, on counter-attack uh, with the speed that they have, the athleticism, the ability to go from back to front quickly. I think there's an obvious route into the, the Barcelona goal this evening which, is, which, will give, which will give them some hope and some optimism in the, certainly in the day while the hours leading up to the game. All right, Kenny, fascinating stuff. We shall talk more football with John Walters in just a little while. But I want to turn our attention to rugby and in particular what's been going on in Australia with Israel Falau, who the latest we hear is he has two days to formally respond or face the sack after being served with a breach of notice by Rugby Australia over his highly controversial social media post. Jack Anderson is on the line. A lawyer in Australia has been following this quite closely. Good morning, Jack, or good evening where you are. Yeah, hello to you all. So, we've been covering this story for the last week or so, and there's obviously been a huge amount of outrage and a big backlash towards Israel Falau, and it feels now we're entering, entering, entering into the more legal side of this. It, it, very straightforward. Look at it would be that he's made outrageous uh, homophobic comments and that he should be fired, but it's not that simple, I guess. 
Yeah, well, in some ways it, it probably is because he's made these comments, he's made these comments before. So what has happened is Rugby Australia, his employer, has said, don't do it again. Um, but he has done it again. Uh, and so they, they had him on a warning and now they said you're facing serious consequences, you're going to lose your job. So in some ways it, it's that straightforward. But of course, it's not really in the whole context. Obviously, there's a, there is a sporting context. He's their best player by far. And it's mm-hmm. a World Cup year. And uh, maybe there's pressure from sponsors here from the other side. But also there's an interesting thing is he's now got 24 hours to reply to this uh, code of conduct hearing. And we we don't even know whether or not he will go for this hearing. But if he does, he'll probably argue two things. You know, first of all, he'll say straightforward kind of a procedural thing. Well, in a way, you've already made a decision. You've already tried to, you know, more or less sack me. So what's this hearing about, you know? And the second point is, if he does go to the hearing, which is interesting, is what will he argue? And he may well argue kind of this human rights, religious discrimination argument saying, I hold these views sincerely. And there's no doubt that he does hold these views sincerely. And why am I being discriminated in the workplace because of this? So so they are the two kind of key issues. And Jack, if he goes down that route of, I guess, free speech, what is the law in Australia in terms of free speech and something like this, which you, you could easily argue is hate speech? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the one thing is it, it's, it's a human right, but not all human rights are absolute. You know, every, all of us who are in the contract of employment, no matter what, um, qualify our own human rights. You know, we, we, we do that every day and human rights come to, into conflict every day. And there is this distinction between free speech and hate speech. This is not hate speech because hate speech is where you incite others towards a kind of a violent reaction. This is plainly kind of religious discrimination argument that he's, he's going to play. And, and But it becomes interesting because it becomes then as an athlete in this situation, can he express himself like this, you know? And, you know, if you look over history, we've had this before in terms of athletes having political views. Some we agree with, some we don't, you know? So, for example, um, with James McLean, for example, with the poppy argument, you know, there's a political element to that. Is he allowed saying, no, I don't want to wear the poppy at work? Um, and, uh, you know, and there's other arguments like, for example, in Australia, one of their most famous sports stars, tennis stars, is a woman called Margaret Court. Mm. And she has some uh, views uh, on homosexuality that are not good. And yet one of the major tennis stadiums here is named after her. So, you know, you can go right back even to Muhammad Ali, who said no to the draft on political and religious grounds. But I think when we come back to this, what he said is something that I found morally repugnant, but also his employer said, we don't mind you practicing your religion in private. In fact, your teammates know about that. But we ask you, under the code of conduct, not to go on social media and do this. And that's what he did. Where do the players' union stand on all this? Yeah, the players' union, their, their big point is the procedural point. Their, their argument is, look, you've prejudged him. Um, whatever about the substance of these arguments, you've already fired him. That's not fair. We have a code of conduct. You know, so, so that's the, their big point. It's an awkward one for them uh, as well, because obviously the, the views that he has are extreme uh, and are not reflective um, of Australia as a whole and certainly not reflective of key sponsors for Rugby Australia. So how do you see this developing then if he does decide to respond over the next 24 hours and he dis- does decide to contest these charges? How do you see it playing out? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the problem is then it goes very legal. So mm. you have a hearing, he has a right to appeal, he may even go to court and we bring in all these conflicting human rights elements. And as is typical with lawyers, the core, the core point gets forgotten, if you like. The core point is what he said, and what he said is not acceptable to his his employers, but it will get wrapped up into procedural things. And remember, they have a Rugby World Cup coming up in October. I mean, he is their key man, really. So, and in an overall context, Rugby Australia is not in a good place. It's in, you think the FAI have it bad, but Rugby Australia are, are, you know, in trouble in lots of ways. They don't need this. 
and, and that's the context you must see it as a whole. So Michael Cech has obviously come out and said that he won't be selecting him, which could be the issue as this develops over the next 24, 48 hours. Is there any way that as this legal procedure makes its way potentially through the courts over the next few months that they end up in a situation come October for a Rugby World Cup where they have no choice but to select Israel Folau or surely Rugby Australia and Michael Cech can just say, listen, we get to pick the team, he's not on it. Yeah, well, first of all, whether Czech should have said that now is is the thing. You know, we haven't even had the code of conduct hearing yet, so whether he should have said that is, is one thing. Uh, but he said it, and and that's the way. And I mean, maybe there may be a settlement where by they don't pick him for the national team, but he continues to play for the Waratahs. Maybe, maybe that's it. We don't really know what Israel Folau wants. Mm. I mean, the comments that we're getting is that. He um, is now more of a preacher than a player. He literally, and he said that, and um, there may also be trouble within the Australian rugby national team itself. Some people don't like his views. Some people are, I won't say fully supportive, but I understand where he's coming from. So how is that going to affect Cheka as well? So there's, you know, legal and sporting issues there. Yeah, and I guess one of the reasons Czech had commented, I'm assuming, is that he was under such huge public pressure to commit to something and to come out and make a statement. What has the public reaction been like in Australia? Is it general outrage or is there a sense that these are his views, they should be heard? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting. I think the general public have felt that he got a chance and now he, he's blown mm -hmm. it with a second chance. And they, they understand his views and the, his private views, etc. There's also, though, a, a kind of a, a legal element to it where a lot of human rights lawyers are saying, well, he has the right to freedom of expression and the, this religious argument. But I think the general public are, are kind of have, have gone, listen, it's an employment situation, which we all face in various ways. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter that he's a sports person. He's an employee and therefore will face the consequences. All right, Jack, thanks a lot for taking the call. All right. Thanks, guys. Jack Anderson there uh, in Australia talking us through the Israel Falau situation. We'll be following that on offtheball.com over the next few days. Now, Pat Nevin was on last night's Off The Ball explaining why he isn't too confident that Spurs can derail Manchester City's title challenge. that way. I mean, I put it as harshly as that. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they managed to well we... get through in the Champions League and then get well beaten in the league game. I, I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised at that at all. The Spurs are just not a team that can do it. And of course, the big thing about Spurs is the new ground. You know, it's not like... The question was asked, I think, by many of us, <coughs> is it going to be another Arsenal where a new stadium, it takes ages for it to really start having an effect? No. Absolutely not. It's having a brilliant effect on them. But away from home, I'm just, I'm just not so sure about them at the moment. So, yeah. uh, if I was, if, if I was like uh, Liverpool fans, I would, I would, I would grit my teeth until they ground and started breaking and and decide to be a Man United fan for mm. a weekend. Yeah, big game coming up on Saturday in the title race. John Walters is on the line. Morning, John. Morning, guys. You okay? Had to get him out of bed. I'd say, Kenny, you know, retired now. He's probably just oh, set the alarm for nine o'clock. Get up, go down, <laughs> get get the bit of brunch in, feed up for the afternoon. You know, he's uh, he's entitled. He's earned it. Nice. He's earned it. Footballers. I'm still on the way into Burnley. You're still. I thought you'd retired. Uh, well, yeah, I'm still going in at the moment uh, until the end of the season. You're uh, retired. Free breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> get the free, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. free breakfast. Get the free physio, the free breakfast, the free lunch. <laughs> Jeez, it's I've a just good stopped life. off at the services for a coffee. That's where I'm at now. You, well, you want to make sure you don't end up like Kilban, I guess, when you're playing in these charity <laughs> games in three or four years and you play for five minutes and the body is destroyed for the next six months. They look, look a bit heavy, did he, Kev? Oh, I'll tell you, he was he was struggling to get to Anfield on Sunday. The old calves are gone. <laughs> He's in good company. So, uh, John, we, we want to chat to you about... We might talk about Burnley in a minute, and uh, I guess at this stage, uh, there'll probably be a good mood, I'd imagine, in Burnley over uh, the last couple of days after the win at the weekend. Is there a sense that, yeah, job done, safe? Yeah, for me it is. I think um, I think as long as, as as long as Cardiff didn't win, I think uh, Burnley was safe. I think they were on 36 points, 39 now. Mm. I just think it's impossible for, for, for to be caught, really, in that, in that third relegation spot. So I think it's now between Brighton and Cardiff. 
One of the um, one of the good things yeah. from the Sunderland documentary on Netflix was you got to see the club as a whole and how relegation affects so many people. We look at the footballers and the players generally will move on. Okay, if you're relegated from the Premier League, I'd imagine a lot of them will take a sizable wage, wage deduction. But in Sunderland, I think it was 85 people were let go when they were relegated from the Premier League to the Championship. Is the atmosphere very different at the club, John, when you're in this sort of relegation battle that, that people are literally fearing for their livelihoods? Yeah, I think so. Uh, players, it's a bit different. Players, uh, a lot of contracts now, your, your wages are sort of cut in half. Um, but I was very mindful of the fact, um, even years at Stoke, it, it was if you go down, it's, it, it's not the players that are affected as much. It's a, it's the staff that are around the club, and it, it, it's all the other people, the kit ladies, uh, the, the, the guys and girls in the kitchen, um, the, the clean stuff, the groundsmen. It, it's all those people, and it can really affect the community if you go down as well, um, because the money that comes in, investments, mm. even just fans coming every week going to a match. Um, so it, it, it's massive, and uh, you know, as players, you, you, you tend to forget that a lot. So it's, it, it's, it's such a big price to get in the Premier League, but to stay there, um, not just for the players, the club, it's for the local community as well. It's massive. And I guess as players as well, harsh as it may seem, you sort of need to forget about that because if you're going onto the pitch with the weight of the entire community of Burnley of thinking about those staff whose livelihoods depend on you delivering on a Saturday afternoon, you're probably not going to play to your peak. No, but but as soon as you're out there, you prepare all week for the match and as soon as you're out there, um, well, personally, as soon as I was playing, I'm forget anything else, any pressures or anything else you're under. Um, you just go out there and play football. But... Uh, well, pressure does does do strange things to people. You see it, um, whatever people are put in, in those situations, whether it be a relegation, the pressure of relegation, or the pressure of of being right up at the top of the league. Um, obviously, different kinds of pressure, but you know, as players, you're used to you know dealing with those situations, and, and you know, doing so with with down the years with with, with Stoke and Ireland as well. Um, I just once you're out there on the pitch, it's, you're out there, you forget everything, and you're just playing football. John, you've obviously uh, you know a lot of the players individually a close relationship with the manager there, Sean Dyche of Burnley. Do you think there'll be kind of any? Will it be minor surge in the summer in terms of players out and players in? It was a funny old season for them this year. Burnley bad start to the season, really struggling. Obviously, going to finish well for them. They're safe as you suggested there, but any areas of the pitch you think in particular will need a bit of strengthening going forward? Um, I think every club, every club looks for a striker, uh, wingers. Possibly midfielder. Um, we've got four centre halves at the moment. I think we, you know, like the James Falkowski will be courted by a few big clubs. Yeah. And then we've got um, the situation with the keepers, where we've got Joe Hart, Tom Eaton, and, and Nick Pope. So you can see, you can see one or possibly Thanks more leaving. Yeah. Um, so it's a difficult one. We're, we're a club that I think from anyone from six teams, maybe, maybe. Everton, even now Wolves, the type of player they're, they're going for. Everyone down is in the same pool um, for players. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very difficult ask because you want Premier League experience. You're probably playing over the odds for players. Um, yeah. And everyone's sort of after the same type of player as well. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it, it's, a diff, it's a difficult ask. But that's where your, your scouts come into the force. And Scar in Europe. You saw Leicester, down, Leicester a few years ago where they're picking players from nowhere. So it's a difficult one. It's what a about, fine balance as well. Yeah, John. What about Robbie and uh, Robbie in particular? Is that Robbie and Jeff? But Robbie in particular, um, Mick spoke about recently about Robbie needing game time going forward. It's going to be a problem for him in the international setup. In terms of how uh, Sean Dyche set up the team, uh, last stage of the season, what role can you see for Robbie potentially going forward at Rub uh, at Burnley? Kind of in a kind of four four two four three three, you you've seen a lot of them up close obviously trained, you know his individual qualities. Can you see a role from can you see him nailing down a position going forward at only over the next kind of uh, twelve months under Deutsch and, and what, what role and what system ideally? Um if I was manager I'd have probably would be one of the first names in the team, without a shadow of a doubt. Um Where? He, he's a, he's a, he's had a well that's the thing. He, I've seen Robbie play in, in numerous positions. I've played against Robbie left back. Um, yeah. And he was a very difficult player to play against. Then he's been left wing back. Then he's been left wing. He's played inside. He's played behind the striker. He did it for Ireland. Uh, if you look at the Italy game, um, we were very narrow in a diamond. Yeah, really enjoyed it. So for Robbie, uh, he just needs to play games. 
you need to, you, you, and it's a difficult one this year because cause, because he was out with a with a terrible injury coming back, and he, he picked up a few little niggles. But then you have Dwight McNeil coming in, who's who's naturally a centre midfielder, but he's been playing it on the left for yeah. for, for Burnley, and he's very talented as well, and he's done really well. And, but for me, Robbie needs to play, and yeah. if he's not going to. I'd like to see him in the team between between now and the end of the season. If he, if he doesn't see himself in the team um, beginning of next year, I think he needs to go and find somewhere to play. Yeah, because um, he needs to be playing. He's such a talent um, and, and and a great lad as well. Um, so he, he has all the the right attitude for everything. He's, he's spot on. He just came back from a horrendous injury and he's looking sharper than ever as well. Yeah. John, I do want to talk to you about the Champions League game tonight, Manchester United and Barcelona. And Ole Gunnar Solskjaer talking about restoring the aura to Manchester United, that aura of almost invincibility that they had at certain times. When you started out playing against United, probably in those latter years of the Ferguson era, when they were still winning titles and there was still that fear factor at the club. Sorry, or maybe there wasn't. Did you feel when you were playing United around eight, nine years ago that there was that aura of going to Old Trafford still that you were almost beaten before you got there? Yeah, um, I'd say a lot of people felt like that. And then it changed. What, what were we saying? We, it changed about four or five years ago. Um, and teams were going there and getting results. I remember Swansea a couple of years on the run went there and got results and it was a bit unheard of, really. It was, mm. it was United, at, United at Old Trafford were... We were running away with it. We were cruising past teams week after week, and it was never, never difficult for them. Um, so it, that's definitely changed, the Old Trafford, and uh, and it just, you know, since he since he beat PSG away, um, they haven't been on a very good run, and they got beat probably four, four out of six, four out of five, four out of six. Um, they won at the they won um, last time round, but they've not been on a great run, and I, I just can't see them getting anything. Tonight at Barcelona, um, Barcelona. I think if you go back, the last time they got beat at home was in was in November. Um, it, uh, yeah, I think I think everyone's calling it as a Barcelona win. I just don't see United getting getting anything out of the game. I know they did went to PSG and got a, an unbelievable result, mm. but yeah, I think it's just too much of a too much of a difficult ask for them. I guess a lot of that aura as well of eight, nine years ago, was built around the defence and Ferdinand and Vidic at the heart of that defence, arguably the best Premier League defence centre-back partnership we've ever seen. Comparing that to where they are now defensively, like, as a striker, would you would you relish going up against this United defence at the moment? Um, well, it wouldn't put fear into me as much as as much as much Ferdinand or Vidic. Um, I think the, they've been they've been a bit all over the shop for a few years, haven't they, in, in terms of in terms of trying to uh, stick with a defensive partnership and mm. get that right, and I think that's a base to work from. It's always been at United, that's always been, always been the case. And I think just over the past few years, he got away from it. He tried to bring in players that hasn't really worked. And, uh, you, you wouldn't be fearful, and then you think the the Barcelona front three um, about how difficult they're going to find that tonight. But obviously, it was only one nil at Old Trafford. They're still in with a chance, but I just, I just cannot see anything apart from. Apart from a, a Barcelona win, John, it'd be interesting your opinion. Just flip it up at the other end of the pitch in terms of United as an attacking uh, force. Um, how you see it tonight? Who your preference would be in terms of who you'd pair or what kind of forward line you'd put up there? Obviously, the options of Lukaku, Martial, Rashford, and Lingard. Verbi, one of them uh, and misses out. Just talking to Nathan there. Uh, potentially, if you'd go with the kind of split strikers and. Lingard at the top of the diamond, maybe as he has done in the previous couple of games. How do you see yourself? What would be your uh, preference now if you're setting this Manchester United team? Which of those forwards uh, that we've just mentioned there would you like to see on the pitch? I can't remember exactly what formation he went with with PSG did, uh, against PSG away. Did he have Lukaku starting or was Lukaku on the bench? Yeah, Lukaku mm. started. Yeah, well, Rashford wasn't the same did as he? the front two, wasn't he? Yeah. The only thing I'd say, I'd say with, with, with Barcelona, they're going to keep the ball. So if you press them, and you're going to play up high. You're going to have Suarez running behind you. If you drop deep, you're going to have Messi picking up in between the holes. Now, Barcelona will get it from the keeper. They'll play out from the back. So that so there's not going to be an abundance of space in behind, in, in behind a, a Barcelona back four. I think Lukaku needs that if he's going to be playing. I think Lukaku needs that space to go into because I don't think, as a striker, when a, when a team are playing deep, he has enough in him to be to be holding up 
link, linking others in this play with his back to goal. You know, when you need a strike, that's that's world class with his back to goal. I think that's where Lukaku possibly falls yeah. down a little bit. I'd be surprised. They need that space to go in behind. Yeah, I know what you mean. I'd agree with you there. Yeah, but I'd be surprised for that reason that you said. You know, I just don't drop off. I let allow almost draw Barcelona onto him this evening. PK and Longley towards the uh, halfway line leave that space in behind just almost just you know just wait be patient just set a few little traps John and then look to spring and the likes of whether it's Lukaku Rashford or Martial then to look that pace uh, use that space down I the think, sides off the shoulders yeah. of those centre halves I think it's the impossible task isn't it you've had the tactics rolled out this morning but I just think it's the impossible impossible task in Barcelona especially away from home now I'm not too sure whether it was last year or the year before. Was it PSG that went and got a result there? Yeah. So, someone someone went and got a, a result at Barcelona. Now, if I was Solskjaer, I'd be looking at how they did that, and I'm sure he has, because, it's as you said, it's the impossible task. They haven't got beat there since November. Um, they're just so good at home. It's almost that, back to that old Trafford aura that United used to have years ago. Well, Barcelona have definitely got that. You, um, you, you asked the question at Stoke go. a lot, John, about whether Lionel Messi could do it on a cold Tuesday night. Oh, I think he'd struggle with that wind, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he could um, feed off, John, yeah. 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 He could feed off a few flick ons from few, John. No problem. We had a few Barcelona boys there, didn't we? We had a few of that Bojan. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we had a few of their friends and the, the Barcelona team come over and, uh, <laughs> and watch them, and uh, <laughs> they, they were different class. So I'm pretty sure, pretty sure he could, he could. Uh, just before we let you go, John, have you been following what's going on at the FAI over the past week and the future of John Delaney and the future of the board? Yeah, I've been uh, just in terms of, of news reports coming out and um, the, the thousand statements that keep getting made every day. Mm. Yeah, it's all over the shop, isn't it? It's, it's, it's. I think well, where, where do we stand at the moment? Is, uh, has John stepped aside while, while he, pending an investigation? Yeah, he's temporarily stepped aside, it seems, uh, pending an independent review. Well, it's just... It, it, whatever's going on there is not right at the moment, and that affects... It's not just affecting the board and affecting there. It's affecting the funding, isn't it? And the funding will go right down to mm. grassroots. And if you start affecting that, that's... that's, uh, that's that's terrible. That's that, that's an awful situation to be in, and that needs to be resolved as quickly as possible. And put personal, put personal situations aside. It's got to be whatever's best, right through the country from from bottom to top. Um, and if the situation is affecting that at the moment, it needs to change. John Delaney was obviously um, very much front and centre oh, during your time as a player, as CEO, but the rest of the board who we've only really seems to have gotten to know over the past week or so, and certainly not the way they would yeah. have wanted us. Did, uh, as players, were you aware of the sort of board setup at the FAI? No, as, as a player, you're, you, you're sheltered from that a little bit. Same as a club, you, you'd probably know more at the club because you're in day and day, but as, as a player, you don't really see that side of it. You're just, you're just in the camp. You train, you play. You're not really involved in that side of it. Um, the only time you really saw John and the board was when you went to away games. For example, when you when you travel into away games, and they were on the on the plane with you on the way back. I think that's the only real time you you, you come across the board. Now, um, as I said, it, I, I, I was with Niall Quinn um, probably f- four weeks ago, uh, and he was quite quite damning uh, of. of of the situation and he was adamant that he needed to change and um you know as a person and Niall um you would you would ask him for his for his mm. input almost if it need, if it needed change and, and and what needed changing because you know he's he's been the chairman of Sunderland he's been there he knows that level he knows different sides of football whereas players just shelter from it a little bit you need someone with with the knowledge of the Knowledge of the Irish game, knowledge of the, uh, the grassroots, the knowledge all the way through, and the board experience as well. And I think someone like Niall has got it. I think so. I think you you will be you you will be asking him for, for his help in any way as well. Um, but as I said, if, if the situation stays the same and the, and the funding's taken away, and it affects it affects a multitude of things, not just not just the Aviva Stadium, not just the. The, the, the national team it, it goes spreads and um, has its roots right through Irish football and if you're affecting that that's 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 a big big problem for Irish football yeah John we'll let you go keep
keep taking advantage of those free lunches for uh, the next couple of months. <laughs> What's that body fat, John? What's He's that body fat? <laughs> Alright, he's gone. He hung up on you there, Kenny. He wasn't, wasn't happy with that body fat. No, he wasn't, wasn't happy with that body fat. No. You just went that step too far yet yeah, again. Yeah, I did. Yeah, you have to. You have to. Nathan. Uh, just a reminder again of our amazing competition for you on OTB AM all this week. It is with thanks to Turkish Airlines, proud sponsors of Cricket Ireland. Ireland facing the busiest summer of cricket we've ever known, hosting some of the biggest teams in the world, such as England, West Indies and Bangladesh. Cricket Ireland are also hosting Zimbabwe and Afghanistan later in the summer. On May 5th, the Ireland's men's team will face England in Malahide with a tri-series against Bangladesh and West Indies to follow. Here at OTB AM, we're giving you the chance to fly anywhere in the world with Turkish Airlines. To enter, just head to the link we've tweeted and posted in our live stream for OTB AM and fill in the entry form. Quite a prize, Kenny. Potato par it? par for you, though. <laughs> it's out of our goal, Chance guys. to fly anywhere in the world, Kenny, with Turkish Airlines. That's a good, that's a good prize. Yeah, right. Ashbourne, that's as far as I'm heading Ashburn. today. <laughs> well, listen, if you're not given the, uh, the good, as, as Michael Healy Ray, Ray would say, you know, a proper Tato Park welcome, there's something wrong. No, 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 under the radar, Nathan, you know me. As long as the Kier, Q Cullen's up and running, I get me free bag of tato Chris, I'll be happy. If you I don't go on to be happy leaving today. If I don't go on to Tato Park's Twitter page at about five o'clock <laughs> and see your picture standing next to Mr. Tato and a big freebie in your hands, I will be shocked. Let's see. All right, let's uh, turn our attention to golf. Uh, because, well, listen, we're still basking in the glow of Tiger Woods winning his 15th major title. Dermot Galise was there at Augusta National on Sunday. He was on the show last night describing the enormous swell of emotion after Tiger Woods' Masters victory. So where? Um, I, I tried to brave uh, the crowd, actually. I went down there. I felt it incumbent on me because of the nature of the occasion. And uh, the thousands there, like, I mean, it was manic, you know, and... Uh, as he was about to finish, or as he finished, actually, all you could hear was tiger, tiger, tiger. And um, there was a, a, an enormous swell of emotion, really. You know, somebody likened it a bit to 86 when Jack Nicholas uh, won his last. But they added, like, that there were tears on that occasion. This didn't seem to be an occasion for tears. It seemed an occasion just to be joyous for uh, the triumph of a human being, really, over adversity. Uh, I, I must admit, I, I was deeply moved by the whole thing. Mm. But as you were saying, as Lawrence was saying about uh, his reaction, uh, I watched him as he walked off the green, walked up the pathway towards the recorders, and he was absolutely beaming. I've never seen a smile from him uh, like it before, you know, and uh, he was uh, tipping hands with people and mm. uh, really just just extremely warm. I mean, uh, not the sort of tiger, the cold, calculating uh, athlete that we once knew. Dermot Galise on last night's Off the Ball. John Duggan has joined us in studio. How are you? Nathan Good and Kenny, how are we doing? Very well. Still, uh, I was watching it back again last night. Oh. <laughs> I only need, only need to watch these things once. just gets better and better. I only need to watch it once. No, the best bit was what Dermot was talking about there was the, the final, the putt going in and the next four or five minutes and the silence where Jim Nance just lets it all hang and you get to hear the cheers of the crowd and you get to hear just this sort of primal roar from Tiger as he's just letting it all out. And obviously with his kids as well, which is yeah, great. It was a nice moment, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was uh, more emotional than I thought it would be, actually. He's been more emotional though. People are saying, "Oh well, I've never seen that emotion." When he won at Hoylake in '06, his dad had just died, and he was extremely emotional with the uh, mm. ball in his eyes out. And uh, you know, when he held that push to get into the playoff in the 2008 US Open, he went crazy. Mm. So I have seen emotion from him, but I just saw. I think what are the emotion I saw from Tiger on uh, Sunday was joy, just pure joy and happiness. Mm. Yeah, uh, it was incredible. And we've only got what four weeks before the next major. Yeah, the PGA, it's unusual that they've kind of flicked the calendar that the PGA is now the second major of the year. They're finishing with the Open in Port Rush. So the PGA is at Bethpage Black, where Woods won the US Open in 2002. The US Big Open is course. at Pebble Beach. Yeah, he's won both courses. So, it, like, it, golf is back, as Butch Harmon said, and uh, it's, it's, it's going to be some, some few months now. It's going to be great. It's going to be box office. Like, it, there's so many plot lines now, including Rory McIlroy. Yeah, we didn't really talk about Rory at all yesterday because obviously everyone just wants to celebrate what Tiger achieved. But there were so many other storylines out of the week when you look at the contenders and where they go from here and Brooks Kepka very nearly forcing a playoff even and he would have been on to four majors potentially out of the last eight and what that would mean for his career. But all the talk for the last 
six months has been about McIlroy. The career Grand Slam, his start to the year and the form he'd shown, the, the way his attitude seemed to have changed, the self-help books he's been reading, the work with Brad Faxon, the improvement in his putting, everything was set up for him to go to Augusta and complete that career Grand Slam. And it ended up where he was basically one of the only leading players in the world who never contended. Justin Rose maybe the only other one. Looking at the form figures going into it, lads. Uh, tied fourth, tied fifth, tied fourth, second, tied sixth, first at the players and tied ninth. Anybody explain that to me? I can't understand it. So what, what let him down? Uh, I think it's the mind. I think it's overthinking. I think he won the 2012 PGA at Key Island by eight shots. He lapped the field. What was he doing back then? Mm. I think it's a, a lack of possible freedom. It's a tightness in the mind that he's on the putting green and the range with Dr. Clayton Skaggs. I don't think I'd be here in Tiger Woods talking about being on the green with some guru. Um, uh, I don't think I've ever heard Tiger Woods. I know he's no. had some swing coaches. But how's that manifesting itself on the, on the golf course then? What, what, what shots are actually, is it as putting in terms of drive, not hitting enough Well, all of this seems to have been a, a reaction. Jump. All of this was a reaction, I think, to what happened on the second hole of the final round of last year's Masters, where he has this eagle putt to go tied for the lead, he leaves it short, and his shoulders slump instantly. And everybody in the entire, around the world watching goes, he knows it's not his day. And he's admitted as much afterwards that he, he was still right in contention. If he'd reacted the right way, could have just kept grinding it out. But he knew his putting was wrong and he let it affect him mentally. So therefore he he's felt He's overcompensated possibly mm. for that now mentally with all this mindfulness juggling and all this kind of thing. So if that doesn't automatically work, where it should. Now it has worked the rest of the year to be fair to him, so obviously he's been working in some way, mm. won the Players' Championship, but as he said after the round, uh, it seems like you guys are more disappointed than I am. That to me is a defensive yeah. thing to say. Uh, he said he wasn't sharp, he says he might have to change his schedule and play now the week before the, the Masters. Well, you know, mm. what, what's that about? Like, well, my game is there, so what is it? Either your game is there mm. uh, and, and then you play well, or it's not sharp and you don't play well. He had 16 bogeys, way too many, and that to me just s says to me he was just out of sync with his mind, and uh, he, was, he was just not, not tuned in, and that swagger that we've always seen from Rory uh, wasn't there this week. And, um, what was he doing when he was winning these majors by big numbers, US Open, US PGA? He probably wasn't thinking as much, I would, I would hazard a guess at, and possibly putting too much pressure on himself. 2014 since his last major, I think now he needs to win a major, any major, before he thinks about winning the Masters mm. again. But he's going to put too much pressure on himself to win a Royal Port Rush, uh, his local, one of his local courses in the summer at the Open. Does that mean, okay, well, I've got to change my schedule now. Um, I've got to now play the Irish Open. At Lehinch, that'd be great for everybody, wouldn't it? Um, well, even that, though, in, in those comments, there's mixed messages all year in terms of he wasn't playing the Irish Open because he wanted to play the week before every major championship. Then he decided not to play the week before the Masters, which is what he touches on there. The line of, you seem more disappointed than I am, fits in with part of the Rory story of the last 18 months that he's very cl clearly wants to get out there, which is golf is not the most important thing in my life that I have a very balanced, well-rounded life and I'm not going to be defined by well, what Well, if that was the, the case, wouldn't you be just absolutely free and lolloping mm. around the course and shooting 65? Sure, it's only golf. It doesn't matter. It's only a little white ball that goes around the field, which I think was, was, that was his Twitter line for, for I don't know if it still is. Mm. Uh, but if, 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 it's, if it's not the most important thing in life, then don't treat it like it's the most important thing in life, winning this career grand slam before you're 30. You're 30 now. You know what? I'm going to completely relax um, even th this to me sounds like pressurized relaxation. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> way of putting it. Yeah, pressurized relaxation. Okay, I'm doing the mindfulness. I'm doing the meditation. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. But how did, yeah, did you mean he's got to strip all of that back in terms of like going back to playing off the cuff? Does that necessarily mean he's got to strip away all of those gurus, advisors who he's 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 taken on board, and just kind of you know just go? Does he literally have to strip it back to, to that extent? I think he just needs to stop looking for the magical answer and just play yeah. golf and then the answer will come. As they all say of the Masters or any tournament, you don't need per play to play perfect to win. Did Tiger Woods play perfect? No, no he Got played a lot of luck. He played very cleverly. He used great course management, no double bogeys, played the balls into the right areas, used his savvy uh, to win, possibly not a, at 100% physical fitness to win the Masters. Um, Rory can do it. Like he's been what top five the last uh, top ten the last five uh, Masters twenty first this time. That's not him though. Mm. So it's it's when he when he goes for the debrief, 
um, whether he's watching off the ball or he's going for another kind of debrief. Um, as you said, I think that, you know, what's the next, hopefully next year we're not hearing something different. Hopefully next year we're hearing, well, I'm going to do my best, I'm playing well, uh, I think I've got the game for the course and we're just going to see how we go. It feels as though the last three, four years we've gone from the gym, that this is my new life now, I get up at 5am in the morning and I'm hardcore about building my body and I've never felt in better shape, I am pitch perfect in terms of when I tee it up, doesn't happen. Is still in good shape, doesn't seem to talk about going to the gym and not doesn't obsess about it quite as much. Last year was the balance in my life, balance in my life. Mm. Doesn't work. This year, it's as you say, this sort of forced mindfulness of I'm reading all these self-help books because I just need to somehow get this positivity into my brain and no matter how hard I have to work at it. Don't talk about it. You know, if you didn't even talk about it, nobody would know about it. And then they wouldn't be asking you in every press conference. So what, what books did you read uh, last week, Rory? Mm. Uh, and what, how does that fit into what you're going to be doing this week? Maybe not just talk about it. Mm. Maybe just like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be quite mute. I'm going to give a few cliches. Um, we're not going to get much out of Brooks Kepka, And he's won two majors in the last year. Um, is he worrying about... Uh, his mind, Brooks mm. Kepka, no, he's worrying about, well, how, how well am I driving the ball? And uh, I just, it, it is inexplicable from the fact that he was playing so well. If he'd been missing cuts all going into this Masters and using the mindfulness uh, conversation, then, he, well, you know, okay, well, he's progressing, he's trying something different because he's out of form. Mm. He was in great form going into it, and that's why it's a little bit hard to explain. Yeah, uh, we discussed this on Golf Weekly last week, and I was making that point that everything that's happened over the past three months is worthless right now when he tees up on the first no, but of the it Masters. Shouldn't, it, but it shouldn't but, be. It shouldn't be. Uh, it's worthless because he hasn't won it. But mm. it, if it's treated as worthless, then that just puts more and more pressure on. You know what? I didn't perform, but I'm going to go and win the next major at Bethpage. The one thing Rory, I guess, has to deal with compared to a lot of those around him now, the likes of Brooks Kepka, is that he's had this massive expectation to be the next Tiger. That's gone now, obviously. Well, maybe Tiger Woods winning the Masters is a good thing for Rory. Perhaps. That, uh, suddenly all the attention now is, all the attention going to Beth Page is firmly on... And the rest of the year, probably. ...can Tiger back it up, rather than Rory can just sneak in there and yeah. go about it. He's certainly not going to be the centre of attention. He's now had five opportunities to win the career Grand Slam. Hasn't taken any of them. Look at the amount of players that have emerged over the last five years. God knows how many more talented golfers are going to emerge over the next five years. Every passing year, it's going to get harder for him to win it. Yes, but he's still very talented. And with Woods winning a, Woods winning a major championship uh, at 43, if the, if the young guns were so brilliant, would he really be part of it? Uh, Phil Mickelson's still hanging around winning tournaments this year. I still think Rory's extremely talented and, and one of the ta most talented player in the, players in the world. It just, there just needs to be, I think, a little bit of a step back uh, and a little bit more lightness of touch uh, to, to get it done. Mm. Uh, I'd be very disappointed for him if he didn't win a major this year, but I think he just needs to win one of them before he gets back into the loop on the Masters and, uh, and hopefully use the confidence of winning another one. Uh, win anyone. It's 2014. Yeah. Uh, Dermot Galise was on last night talking about what will be the big storyline of the year as to just how many majors Tiger Woods can win and can he catch Jack Nicholas' major tally? You would have to think in terms the whole market and things only kick in now. Yeah. I mean, Nike were already at it yesterday afternoon. I mean, it is all about the the race to Jack, isn't it? Yeah. So I I think the, the schedule will narrow back to what it was in the day, and it's all about. I mean, it's all about these next four majors from from now on. I think whether or not he gets here will be a very interesting question. I sure will. He was definitely shattered last year, and at the Ryder Cup he was a shell. I think he hadn't anticipated doing so well and winning the Tour Championship. Uh, Jack uh, quipped Dermot that he's quaking in his boots. So what chance now Sorry. for Woods? Um, well, I mean, thinking of what Lawrence was saying there, I mean, Lee, Lee Trevino, as we know, was struck by lightning and had serious back problems in the mid-70s. And uh, I think he won the last of his six majors in 1985 or 86, you know, about 10 years later. Now, I, I don't see any reason why Tiger, once he takes care of, of uh, his health, and uh, doesn't overdo it. I mean, there was no question he was he was very tired last year at the Ryder Cup. But uh, he's, he, he said afterwards yesterday in his press conference that he was definitely cutting back on his schedule this year. Mm. So I think if he manages his tournaments, I mean, Nick was at his peak, played no more than 12 or 13 PGA uh, events every year. And I think that's what Tiger's going to finish doing. And I wouldn't bet against him uh, winning another three or four majors. I really wouldn't. 
Phil Egan has joined us in studio. Good morning. Morning, lads. How are you doing? Hi, Phil. Uh, so Arsenal back in the top four. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it was an absolute gift for them. It was. So if anyone didn't see this, Pierre Emerick Aubameyang scored the goal. Yeah, the heel of ben fortune Foster was the best headline. Howler. Yeah, that was the best headline in the papers this morning. The heel of fortune. So Ben Foster has he, he knows where Aubameyang is, but he completely underestimates the pace of Aubameyang because as he goes to clear it, then it hits Aubameyang, goes in one nil. Then a minute later. Troy Deeney is sent off for an elbow on Lucas Torreira. You think back to the comments he made last season about oh, Arsenal. Honest. No cojones. And he, what he's also said as well, I always like to get an early whack in against <laughs> Arsenal. And that's exactly what he did. But so, so referees since that remember comment, that. He's missed the penalty against yeah. Arsenal and got sent off in the next two games. Yeah, exactly. That was the game at the Emirates last season. Mm. He missed the penalty. I remember, your, I remember listening to your commentary and then he, uh, he misses the penalty. But yeah, so Arsenal are into the top four after that 1 0 win against Watford. We can hear from Arsenal manager Unai Emery now. He admits the red card was a big moment in the game. Unai the red card is very important because it uh, helps us uh, to, to be better with this superiority on the pitch. And the first goal also uh, was very important for, for do this difference. After, uh, a little, I think, uh, we, we had anxiety for uh, to be more calm, more control, good positioning. I was I was uh, watching Game of Thrones, so I watched the first half, and so then just watched Monday Night Rugby or Monday Night Rugby, Monday Night <laughs> Football afterwards. It looked as though Watford absolutely destroyed them in the second. If you half. turn on the second half, you wouldn't know Arsenal had a man advantage, and he did try to change things. He br he brought on Ozil, he brought on Maitland Niles, he tried to get more control, but yeah, they're just it's. I, it'd be unbelievable if they finish in the top four. I don't know how, but I've even been going through the points and their mm. remaining fixtures. I actually think, looking at their fixtures, they could finish in the top four. They've none of the top six left. They've three away games. I don't think they're going to win the three away games. Even if they win one of them and draw two, win their two home games, that'll probably be enough. So that's their second win in their last ten away games in the Premier yeah. League? Their first clean sheet away from home? In 16 attempts. All uh, season? But generally, it's been better. The, the work ethic of the team, the energy levels have been better, tactically better uh, yeah, set up. Yeah, there's a real kind of energy to how they play. I know you'd look at their uh, form away from home and think, oh, no, nothing's changed. Mm. That has. Ours from the start of the season, you can go going after players, getting tired, making tackles, hunting the ball, uh, impacts, real, real kind of work ethic and a real structure in terms of what they're doing, particularly our possession uh, in the football. So that's one of the big reasons why Phil suggested they're still in the run, which a lot of people wouldn't have uh, thought possible at the start of the season. So I give them huge credit for that. They're still in the position they are at the moment going into the last few games. So do you think it's one from three that Spurs are pretty much guaranteed top four and then it's one from Chelsea, United and Arsenal? Yeah, well, so about a month ago, I, I thought it'd be uh, United in Spurs, but Arsenal have hung, uh, have hung around there. Chelsea have had to put it, uh, it turned it around a little. They looked as if things yeah. were falling apart there. It's so tough to call. It, it really is. A lot could depend on that United and Chelsea game. And mm. You know, you were at Anfield on, on Sunday. As soon as Hazard plays on the left with Higuain there, now, he actually prefers playing with Giroud, but if they go to Old Trafford and Sarri sticks to playing Hazard as a false nine, they won't beat United. No, it's hard to see it. That he was so ineffectual yeah. uh, in that first hour or so against Liverpool on Sunday. The other thing is, I guess, the fixture list then. United have to go to Everton this Sunday, then they have the Manchester Derby, then they have to play Chelsea. Like that, and, and, and after form, playing Barcelona. It's the form as well. Again, you look at Manchester United you know, a month, six weeks ago, absolutely Rolls-Royce stuff in terms of your confidence, quality of football, and it's fragmented a little bit since then, losing games, but just to perform, even games they've won, even at the weekend, We're performance level. Awful against West Ham. Yeah, yeah, at a crucial stage of the season, it looks as if they, they've just lost a little bit of momentum. So I'll be a little bit worried now, having maybe six weeks, so I said I'd fancy him for, for one of those top four, probably... They go out of the Champions League tonight, they lose to Everton at Goodison, get beaten in the Manchester derby, and then they go to Chelsea, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer fighting to save his job. <laughs> Could you imagine? Have you signed, that, he signed, a, he signed that contract? He signed a three-year deal. Yeah. Is this a Martin O'Neill FAI type scenario? Yeah, like it's... Even his press conference yesterday, Solskjaer, you know, it, the, the Lions, you know, this is football, anything can happen. They're starting to wear... Well, they've already worn thin. Four defeats in five, and, you know... They made the appointment permanent. They announced it during the international break, and I just never understood why they just couldn't wait till the end of the yeah. season. I'm the same. 
I felt what, what they said initially, they came out and they put them in place there and said they'd live at the end of the season mm-hmm. and have a look who else was out, who was available, then enter negotiations and then make a decision. It was exactly the right thing to do. And you can understand it to a point, these, these things have gone that well. But we know in football how quickly things can change, Phil. Like. So, you know, just take a deep breath. Don't give him the job. Hold off to the summer. I'm not saying he wouldn't get it mm. anyway. I don't. I just don't know how far they've gone in terms of exploratory talks with the likes of Pochettino's agents, Allegri, whoever else was out there. Big heavy hitters. Are you the biggest club in the world? You can, as yeah. you say, you can take your time. Yeah, Soldier's not going to turn you down. Yeah, but if the fact they've had a push, they've picked up the phone point and thought, listen, there's no value there. No mm. way we're getting him out. Allegri said no, not 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 this year. They may have thought, well, look, he's probably our only option. He's probably the best man at the moment. But for me, um, if they haven't pushed hard enough behind the scenes in terms of Pochettino and Levy could we maybe prize him out Allegri or whoever else that it is I'd be a little bit surprised that they've suddenly got caught up in this bit of a love in as well as he's done Solskjaer and I've complimented I think he has done very well but that that turn can come very uh, quickly we saw Cardiff he struggled he struggled a lot there was a rabbit between the headlights yeah, in terms of time out when they, things were struggling there he didn't quite have but the ju- But just then on this run of form now do you look at it as a sort of levelling out that this is sort of where Manchester United are with the squad that Solskjaer has do you think that they're the type of players who because Mourinho went that the atmosphere got quite toxic there was this automatic boost and actually Solskjaer is always going to struggle to maintain this no I, I think that, that that natural just Mourinho going I mm. think you're right anybody coming in you can make the argument thank God uh, he's gone although I'd give him a little bit more credit for that type of personality he is. I think people naturally gravitate towards him I think tactically the setup for a few of the games I think he's done very well you could point towards Carrick Field and maybe their contributions in that respect I think you'd argue it might help him in some respect this little dip off when he goes to the board now in the summer because he is the manager going forward he can say look we need to strengthen, and this is why you've seen the last six or eight games of the season. This is where we're deficient. This is where we need to spend our money, uh, centre half, centre midfield, even two centre midfield. You made the argument that maybe a year ago, Matic nailed in the whole of midfield position, Pogba, maybe a, another, another top quality midfielder. I think now you could probably bang in the door and say, Do you know what, we probably need two. Matic, maybe another 12 mm-hmm. months there, max. Should they just get rid of Pogba? Possibly. Like, if it means you get another 120, no. 130 million. You know, th- he's at the club since after Euro 2016 and we're still talking about him as a player who hasn't really done it for United. Well, Connor's watching on YouTube says the United bubble has burst. Pogba's head is in Madrid and he's got bored with Ole already. As predicted, he has the attention span of a six-year-old. PSG result was a complete nutter fluke. Oh, if he wants out, don't get me wrong, a player that high profile Pogba, if he lets it be known that he wants out, he fancies that move, it's where he wants to be. But yeah, get him out, get him out the door, get as, as, as much as you can for him. But for me, if his head's in the, in the right place, the qualities that he has um, in terms of goals and assists, operating in the right area of the pitch, which predominantly Solskjaer has been playing him in, for me, again, he's a player you have to build a team around, as long as his heart's in it, and that's where he wants to be. If not, He's looking elsewhere, get him out the door and start again. What else you got? Okay, well, we'll talk about, we've been talking about Manchester United, obviously play Barcelona tonight, 1-0 down. I was very impressed with the tactics board. But I believe one, that you get... What, not, the colours one on thing. not the colours on it. How can you put Manchester United in blue? They, they played in blue. Football. They played in blue. Yeah, but um, obviously, <laughs> the worry for United is Barca have progressed from 39 of their 41 European ties in which they've won the first leg away from home. But one thing you didn't mention, Solskjaer, I don't know if you're aware, but he's back at the new Camp 20 years on. Why, what happened there previously? I think he scored some goal, but he was actually asked if he believed in fate. I believe that you get what you deserve in, uh, in sports, that you put your, uh, if you put your life and effort and determination, everything you have, you get exactly what you deserve. And, uh, but sometimes people, have, uh, they've said to me, uh, it's a, it has to be our year because it's 20 years ago. I used to play with number 20. We're back at Camp No. So, but to go through, we have to uh, perform and we have to deserve it. That's, you can't say we're just going to rely on faith. No. He was going with it though for a good 10 yeah. seconds there. He was like, in his true. head, he was like, yeah, oh, I remember that glory. And then he was, oh, I can't keep going with this. Uh, Eventually, I'm going. Well, I, I agree with him. I'm not, I'm not a big believer in faith. You've got to do the work, you've got to do the mm. preparation, all of those. Get those things right. Yeah, you can go and win the game. Then, if you wanted to say, oh, it's fate, yeah, fair enough. But if you don't do those things, 
don't get those foundation blocks in place, you're, you're never going to have a chance of winning. Run us quickly through the last couple of stories. Well, the other tie is going to be a cracker tonight. One all between Juventus and Ajax heading into the second leg in Turin. Ronaldo was rested at the weekend. Ajax scored six at the weekend. They've scored 106 goals in the league this season. So both those games kick off at eight o'clock. Big game in the Premier League. You kind of feel it's last chance saloon for Cardiff. Five points behind Brighton. It's at the Amex Stadium. Both have lost three in a row. Brighton were hammered 5-0 by Bournemouth at the weekend and dare I say it, there's actually some pressure on Chris Hewton now. Yeah, they were booed off at half-time. Mm. Uh, Johan van Graan's left the door open for Paul O'Connell and Ronan O'Gara to return to Munster. This would be the dream ticket. O'Connell obviously is at Stade Francais. He's going to leave at the end of the season. O'Gara is highly sought after. He's the assistant coach with the Crusaders. Van Graan was speaking to Virgin Media Sport and he said he's been in constant contact with them. There's a lot of quality coaches all over the world and he's going to do what's best for Munster. And he says nothing's ever impossible. And just something to keep an eye on this morning at 11 o'clock, Michael Judge will bid to make the Crucible. He plays James Cahill in the final qualifying round of the World Snicker Championship. Unfortunately, Ken Doherty was beaten 10-4 by Scott Donaldson. Mm. And Jimmy White as well was beaten by Ellie Carter. I thought you were going to say, keep an eye on for the afternoon. Get yourself another good eight-hour fix of a Rockdust Committee. <laughs> dun, Live. Dun, dun. Cannot wait. <laughs> that is us pretty much done. Uh, you can watch back the tactics board. It'll all be up on offtheball.com. Kevin, though, was watching it and said, great stuff, Kenny. But simply what you're saying is, play a long ball. <laughs> uh, well, no. Yeah. It's a bit more it's a bit more complicated than, than that. that. Uh, Kenny, enjoy Tato Park. Yeah. You don't get in for free at this stage, there's something horribly oh, wrong. No, no. And if you see Kenny at Tato Park, of course, he loves a <laughs> selfie. Don't forget, he loves oh, a selfie. Oh, yeah. And a bag oh, of yeah. Particularly just as he's getting on the <laughs> roller coaster. <laughs> and a pack of Tato's. I'm not sacrificing that spot. Pack of Tato's. For anybody. You get your Tato's as well? And I, I'll have a, you can, I'm, I'm a Kells and a Donald's. Anything I'll do, will, me. You, will you splash the That's cash? That's not the thing to say you, going into Tao. No, 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 you won't let you in. Will you splash the cash? You know, will you have the bit of lunch there? Are you going to bring the packed lunch? What's the, what's the grub like on soy sauce? Sandwich. You, you, Crisp yeah. sandwich, Kenny. Crisp sandwich. Crisp sandwich, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go for it. That's a possibility. Uh, we're live across all our social channels, News Talk and OffTheBall.com from 7 o'clock tonight. Episodes 2 and 3 of the Game of Thrones podcast, Off the Wall, are live now. Elephants, Kenny. Elephants. That's what you can look forward to in the final season. I'll be back here from OTB AM from 7.45 tomorrow morning. If you missed any of the show, you can podcast it or watch it back on YouTube or offtheball.com. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Good luck.